Hello, good evening and welcome to The Show Must Go Online, a weekly live stream working through the complete plays of Shakespeare in the order they were believed to have been written. I'm Robert Miles, actor, writer, director and creator of The Shakespeare Deck. A warm welcome and thank you to everyone tuning in all around the world to see the first of Shakespeare's history plays. Henry VI Part 1 will commence in approximately 15 minutes time. The first half will run for approximately 90 minutes, whereupon we'll have a 10 minute interval followed by the second half which runs at approximately one hour. Please be aware that the show may feature some loud noises. Thanks to Dan Bolio of Seven Stages Shakespeare for, for, for tonight's edit. Be sure to check out uh, Shakespeare Happy Hours, which is coming soon to Zoom and Twitter. Thanks also to Ben, Riona and Kate, Ed and Kay, Lucy, Paraffin, and many more for their amazing support behind the scenes. And if you'd like to play along at home tonight, our game is Guess the Number of Alarums. Please subscribe to the channel to get updates for next week's reading of Henry VI Part 2, a link to which is also in the description for this video, and hit the bell icon to get a reminder shortly before we go live. On social, you can tag me at Rob Miles on Twitter, or follow at The Show Must Go Online on Insta and Facebook. Share your reactions using the hashtag Show Must Go Online. At this time, it is my very great pleasure to introduce, first and foremost, as usual, our indomitable producer, Sarah Peachy. Hi, I'm Sarah. I'm an innovation project manager and actor from Glasgow. And our cast for tonight's production of Henry VI, Part One, playing Talbot, Kristen Atherton. Hello, I'm Kristen Atherton. I'm a professional actress from Sheffield. Playing Joan Lapoussel, Jessica Martin. Hi, I'm Jessica Aaron Martin. I'm a professional actor based in Los Angeles. Gloucester, Elizabeth Dennehy. Hi, Elizabeth Dennehy, based in Los Angeles, professional actor and teacher. King Henry VI, Sam Charney. Hi, I'm Sam. I'm an eighth grade theater manager at Denver School of the Arts. Suffolk, Mark McMinn. Hello, everyone. I'm Mark McMinn. I'm a professional actor from Glasgow. Charles and ensemble, Harley Jane Kozak. Hello, I'm a professional actor living in Los Angeles. Bishop of Winchester, Daniel Czech Lucas. Hello, I'm Daniel Czech Lucas. I'm a professional actor based in London. Richard Plantagenet, Adam Courting. I am Adam Courting. I'm a professional actor from London. Mortimer, Kim Durham. You're on mute, Kim. <laughs> oh, I, saw, I thought somebody was going to unmute me. Sorry. Uh... Hi, Kim. <laughs> Okay, Warwick, Mariam Grace. Hello, I'm Mariam Grace and I'm a professional actor from London. Bedford, Jim Trimmer. Hi, I'm Jim Trimmer. I'm an amateur actor from Kingston-upon-Thames and a humanist celebrant. Somerset, Charlotte Harvey. Hi, I'm Charlotte, a professional actor in New York City. Exeter, Imelda D'Souza. Hi, I'm Imelda D'Souza and I'm a professional actor from London. Rainier, Raphael Corkill. Hi, I'm Raphael Corkill from the UK, professional actor under lockdown in New York City. Alan Song, Micah Weiss. Hi, I'm Micah. I'm a professional actor and musician living in Oklahoma. Burgundy, Stephen Moss. Hello, I'm uh, Stephen, uh, a journalist based in London. Margaret, Audrey Lebrelec. Hello, I'm Audrey Lebrelec, French actress, professional, based in London. Bastard of Orléans, Katrina Michaels. Hi there, my name's Katrina and I'm from London, but based in New York City and a professional actor. Boy and John Talbot, Evie Hargreaves. Hello, I'm Evie. I'm an actor in training based in lovely Lancashire. Salisbury and Ensemble, Janet Lawson. Hi, I'm Janet. I'm a professional stage combat teacher and fight director based in Glasgow. Mayor and Ensemble, Will Gillam. Hi, I'm Will. I'm a professional last actor based in London. Lucy and Ensemble, Ivan Doan. Hi, I'm Ivan Doan. I'm a professional actor between Berlin and London. Falstaff and Ensemble, Roger Parkins. Hello, I'm Roger Parkins. I'm a professional actor based in Essex. Countess of Auvergne and Ensemble, Myra Lee Bell. Hi, I'm Myra Lee Bell. I'm a student actor at Bath Spa University. 
Vernon and Ensemble, and Swing, Meg Hodgson. Hi, I'm Meg. I'm an actor and performance artist from London. And Swing 2, Scott Ellis. Hi, I'm Scott. I am an actor and director based in London. And returning from a very successful segment in last week's show, doing tonight's fights, our fight directors Yarrett Dor and Enrique Ortuño. Hi, I'm Yared. I'm originally from Israel. Hi, I'm Enrique, originally from Spain. Uh, we're both fight directors and we'll be fight doubling. Yay! Thank you all so much for giving your time and talent freely tonight to entertain our audience. At this point, to introduce the play, I am delighted to welcome our special guest, Ema McHugh. If you have any questions for Ema, please drop them in the live chat and we can see if we can answer them at the interval. Ema McHugh teaches Shakespeare at the theatre, uh, sorry, Shakespeare and theatre at NUI Galway and Trinity College, Dublin. She's the author of Irish Shakespeare's Gender, Sexuality and Performance in the 21st Century, forthcoming from Routledge. She specialises in early modern performance studies, Shakespeare and Ireland, theatre and celebrity culture, gender and sexuality studies, histories of actors, acting and acting practices, and theatre history and historiographies. Ema, the play is Henry VI, part one, and the floor is yours. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you to Rob and Sarah for having me here tonight. And thanks to everyone tuning in. Hello. How are you? It, it's really great to see such enthusiasm for theatre and this coming together during this really kind of horrible, anxious, worrying times. And it, it's really lovely. It, it's really heartening, I should say. Um, so yeah, it's great that this is happening. Okay. So, right, the topic at hand. Um, Henry VI, part one. I, I was almost worried for that. I always accidentally say Henry IV, part one, whatever. Oh, it's, it's, it's too many Henrys, okay? Right, okay. So, Henry, Henry VI, part one. Okay, so um, this is recorded in the Stationers' Register as having been performed first in March 1592. And it's, it's one of Shakespeare's earliest written plays, and perhaps also um, one of the earliest instances of Shakespeare collaborating with other writers. And there's strong evidence to suggest that Thomas Nash had a hand in this play. Okay. Um, you know, in terms of thinking about this play, you know, um, as, as, as Rob says, um, I very much focus on performance in my work. I'm a theater and I focus on modern contemporary and um, theatre history um, um, and performance. And so I've always been quite intrigued by um, like how this, how this play kind of fits in with the performances of Shakespeare's history. So we tend to see this play generally um, as part of a, of a wider, you know, say history cycle, like you would see at the RFC or um, any other history cycles or something like that, or even um, of like the um uh, you know uh, like an adaptation like you know the wars of the roses kind of narrative or like even you know something like that because chronologically speaking this place fits in at the day um you know first we have first we have like the first first half of the history cycle with richard ii um henry henry the fourth parts one and two then henry the fifth and then this comes next henry the sixth part one and then following on with um henry the six parts two and three and then which the second. So with this play um, particularly, um, I'm intrigued really how this play tends to be, how it tends to be incorporated into, um, into the narrative. It tends to be cut, it tends to be truncated, it tends to be short. It sometimes gets amalgamated with having six part two, you know. I, I feel like sometimes some theater makers are quite in a rush to get to get Richard of Richard on stage, to be honest. But anyway, um, so that's so that's you know think about chronology and and think about narrative. And this fits into that you know it's quite interesting to me, and I'll get onto that a little bit again before before I finish up. So to give an overview of what goes on in this play, so Henry V has just died, and you no, know, he didn't die. You know, at the end of his life, after a few you know decades of rule. Um, he died in his he died in his, in his prime, and it's a very inconvenient time because his heir, I mean, the sixth, is a young is a young child, you know. So 
you know, and he's not really able to be king. And as you'll see in Henry, the, um, the, the remaining parts of the trilogy, he doesn't really want to be king either. You know, he's not really, not really interested in that at all. And it's kind of, it kind of provides the catalyst of a, of what a lot for, for much of what happens um, in, um, in over, the, over the next few plays. So we, we have this we have this going on. So we also have these military difficulties with plants in this play. You know, the Dauphin has been crowned and Talbot, our heroic captain, has been captured, but also not for long. Okay. So we have two things that really come to the fore in this play, really. So we have this growing political crisis, this growing political instability in England, you know, like epitomized by this. Um, now growing feud and enmity with Richard Plantagenet, who later becomes Duke of York, and um, the Duke of Somerset. And of course, we have that famous meeting um, between the two, where they pick a white rose and a red rose, which symbolise houses of York and Lancaster. And of course, secondly, we have the wars in France, you know, and we have um, two particular characters come to the fore here. So, of course, we have Talbot on the, on the English side. But of course, we have um, Joan Lacusel or Joan of Arc, as she's commonly known. And whereas, um, you know, the, this play has a bit of a, it doesn't have a great, repu have a great reputation. A lot, lot, lot of people are kind of, it does have detractors, but we have this, like, this unforgettable turn in, in Joan Lacusel. And we really try to speak, um, you know, she, she's a really good character. Um, but I, there's one thing to kind of jump on, and part of why, like, why I find it quite, find it quite, quite interesting, is, you know, it's part of my, own, like, my general interest in the history, is, you know, there is evidence to show that the, part one, this play, was written after Henry the Sixth, part two and three. So, you know, so kind of, in some ways, it's sort of like a prequel, in, in some ways, really. You know, so um, thinking about that. So, if um, for me, um, what's interesting about this um, about about this play is, you know, we're watching the pieces slowly fall into place for the rest of the events of of, this, of the trilogy, so to say. I know, and as um, and as we'll, as we'll see towards the end, one very important player gets introduced just towards the end. And that's Queen Margaret, and then you know, as we all know, she has <laughs> she has a lot to do. She has a lot, lot, lot to um, get up to in the in the next few plays, you know. So, um, and also as well, you know, it, it's also nice to hear the play not truncated or cut, or well, well, severely cut, um, as it usually is. So I hope all of you tuning in really enjoy this. And um, look, for, look forward to hearing your questions. I uh, think so. I'm looking forward to um, watching it all tonight. So um, thank you. Thank you so much, Ema. Really appreciate that. And now, without further ado, it is my great pleasure to introduce to you all Henry the Sixth, Part One. <laughs> with black. Yield day to night. Comets importing change of time and states. Brandish your crystal tresses in the sky and with them scourge the bad revolting stars that have consented unto Henry's death. King Henry V, too famous to live long. England ne'er lost a king of so much worth. 
England ne'er had a king until his time. What should I say? His deeds exceed all speech. We mourn in black. Why mourn we not in blood? What? Shall we curse the planets of mishap that plotted thus our glorious aura though? Or shall we think the subtle witted French, conjurers and sorcerers that, afraid of him by magic verses, have contrived his end? He was a king blessed of the king of kings. Unto the French the dreadful judgment day, so dreadful will not be as was his sight. The battles of the Lord of hosts he fought. The church's prayers made him so prosperous. Church, where is it? Had not churchmen prayed, his thread of life had not so soon decayed. None do you like, but an effeminate prince, whom like a schoolboy you may overawe. Gloucester, what e'er we like, thou art protector, and lookest to command the prince and realm. Thy wife is proud, she holdeth thee in awe, more than God or religious churchmen may. Nay, not religion, for thou lovest the flesh. And ne'er throughout the year to church thou goest, except it be to pray against thy foes. Cease, cease these jars and rest your minds in peace. Let's to the altar. Heralds, wait on us. Instead of gold, we'll offer up our arms. Since arms avail not now that Henry's dead. Henry V, thy ghost I invocate. Prosper this realm, keep it from civil broils, combat with adverse planets in the heavens. A far more glorious star thy soul will make than Julius Caesar or bright. My honourable lords, health to you all. Sad tidings bring I to you out of France, of loss, of slaughter and discomfiture. Guyenne, Champagne, Rheims, Rouen, Orléans, Paris, Gisors, Poitiers are all quite lost. What sayest thou, man, before dead Henry's course? Speak softly, or the loss of those great towns will make him burst his lead and rise from death. Is Paris lost? Is Rouen yielded up? If Henry were recalled to life again, these news would cause him once more yield the ghost. How were they lost? What treachery was used? No treachery, but want of men and money. Amongst the soldiers, this is muttered, that here you maintain several factions, and whilst a field should be dispatched and fought, you are disputing of your generals. Awake, awake, English nobility. Were our tears wanting to this funeral? These tidings would call forth her flowing tides. Me their concern, regent I am of France, Give me my steeled coat, I'll fight for France. Away with these disgraceful wailing robes. Wounds will I lend the French instead of eyes to weep their intermissive miseries. Lord, view these letters full of bad mischance. France is revolted from the English quite, except some petty towns of no import. The Dauphin Charles is crowned king in Reims. The bastard of Orléans with him is joined. Renier, Duke of Anjou, doth take his part. The Duke of Alençon flieth to his side. The Dauphin crowned king, all fly to him. Oh, whither shall we fly from this reproach? We will not fly, but to our enemies' throats. Bedford, if thou be slack, I'll fight it out. Gloucester, why doubtest thou of my forwardness? An army have I mustered in my thoughts that wherewith already France is overrun. My gracious lords, uh, to add to your laments wherewith you now bedew King Henry's hearse, I must inform you of a dismal fight betwixt the stout Lord Talbot and the French. What, wherein Talbot overcame, is it so? Oh no, wherein Lord Talbot was o'erthrown. More than three hours the fight continued, where valiant Talbot, above human thought, enacted wonders with his sword and lance. Hundreds he sent to hell, and none durst stand him. Here, there, and everywhere enraged he slew. The French exclaimed the devil was in arms. All the whole army stood and gazed on him. His soldiers, spying his undaunted spirit, A Talbot! A Talbot! cried out amain, and rushed into the bowels of the battle. 
Here had the conquest fully been sealed up if Sir John Falstaff had not played the coward. He being in the vowed, placed behind with purpose to relieve and follow them, cowardly fled, not having struck one stroke. Hence the general rack and massacre. In clothes were they with their enemies. A base balloon to win the Dauphin's grace thrust Talbot with a spear into the back, whom all France with their chief assembled strength does not presume to look once in the fate. If Talbot slain, then I will slay myself. Oh no, he lives. I was, but he is took prisoner, and Lord Scales with him, and Lord Hungerford, most of the rest slaughtered or, or took likewise. His ransom there is none, but I shall pay. I'll hail the dolphin headlong from his throne. Farewell, my masters, to my task will I. Bonfires in France forthwith I am to make to keep our great St. George's feast with all. Ten thousand soldiers with me will I take whose bloody teeds will make all Europe quake. So you had need, for Orléans is besieged. The English army is grown weak and faint. The Earl of Salisbury craveth supply and hardly keeps his men from mutiny, since they so few watch such a multitude. Remember, lords, your oaths to Henry sworn, either to quell the Dauphin utterly or bring him in obedience to your yoke. I do remember it, and here take my leave to go about my preparation. I'll to the tower with all the haste I can to view the artillery and munition, and then I will proclaim young Henry King. To Elton will I, where the young king is, being ordained his special governor, and for his safety there, our best devise. Each hath his place and function to attend. I am left out. For me, nothing <coughs> remains. But long I will not be Jack out of office. The king from Eltham I intend to steal and sit at chiefest stern of public wheel. <laughs> Act one, scene two. Enter Charles the Dauphin, the Duke of Alençon and Rainier. <laughs> Mars, his true moving even as in the heavens, so in the earth to this day is not known. Late did he shine upon the English side. Now we are victors upon us, he smiles. What towns of any moment we have? At pleasure, here we lie near Orléans. Otherwise, the famished English, like pale ghosts, faintly besiege us one hour in a month. They want their porridge and their fat bull beeves. Either they must be dieted like mules and have their provender tied to their mouths, or piteous they will look like drowned mice. Let's raise the siege. Why did we hide here? Huh? Talbot is taken, whom we were want to fear, remaineth none but mad brain Salisbury, and he may well in fretting spend his gold. And no men, no money hath he to make war. Hmm? Sound, sound alarum. We will rush on them. Now, for the honor of the forlorn French. Ali! Ali! Ah. They are beaten back by the English with great loss. Ah. Enter Charles, Alan Song, and Rainier. Whoever saw the like, what men have I? Dogs, cowards, dastards! I would ne'er have fled, but that they left me midst my enemies. Salisbury is a desperate homicide. <laughs> he fighteth as one weary of life. For out, a countryman of ours records England all Oliver's and Roland's bread during the time Edward III did reign. More truly now may this be verified, for none but Samson's and Goliath's it sendeth forth to skirmish. One to ten! Lean, raw-boned rascals, who would e'er suppose they had such courage and audacity? Let us leave this town, for they are harebrained slaves, and hunger will enforce them to be more eager. Of old, I know them. Rather with their teeth the walls they'll tear down than forsake the siege. 
Where is the Prince Dauphin? I have news for him. Bastard of Orléans, thrice welcome to us. Methinks your looks are sad, your cheer appalled. Hath the late overthrow wrought this offence? Be not dismayed, for succor is at hand. A holy maid hither with me I bring, which by a vision sent to her from heaven, ordained is to raise this tedious siege and drive the English forth the bounds of France. That the spirit of deep prophecy she hath, what's past and what's to come she can describe. Go, call her in. But first, to try her skill, Renier, stand thou as Dauphin in my place. Question her proudly, let thy looks be stern. By this means shall we sound what skill she hath. Fair maid, is thou wilt do these wondrous feats? Ranier, is thou that thinkest to beguile me? Where's the Dauphin? Oh, come, come from behind. I know thee well, though never seen before. Be not amazed, there's nothing hid from me. In private, I will talk with thee apart. Stand back, you lords, and give us leave a while. She takes upon her bravely at first dash. Dauphin, I am by birth a shepherd's daughter, my wit untrained in any kind of art. Heaven and Our Lady gracious hath it pleased to shine on my contemptible estate. Lo, whilst I was waiting on my tender lambs, and a sun's parching heat displayed my cheeks, God's mother deigned to appear to me, and in a vision full of majesty, willed me to leave my base vocation and free my country from calamity. Her aid she promised an assured success. In complete glory she revealed herself, and whereas I was black and swart before, with those clear rays which she infused on me, that beauty am I blessed with which you may see. Ask me what question thou canst possible, and I will answer unpremeditated. My courage try by combat, if thou darest, and thou shalt find that I exceed my sex. Resolve on this. Thou shalt be fortunate if thou receive me for thy warlike mate. Thou hast astonished me with thy high terms. Only this proof all of thy valor make. In single combat thou shalt buckle with me, and if thou vanquishest, thy words are true. Otherwise, I renounce all confidence. I am prepared. Here is my keen edged sword decked with five flower de luces on each side. The which at terrain in St. Catherine's churchyard, out of a great deal of old iron, I chose forth. Then come a God's name, I fear no woman. And while I live, I'll ne'er fly from a man. Ah! Oh! Oh! Hey, stay thy hands, thou art an Amazon, and fightest with the sword of Deborah. Her mother helps me, else I were too weak. Oh, whoe'er helps thee, tis thou that must help me. Impatiently I burn with thy desire. My heart and hands thou hast at once subdued. Excellent Pucelle, if thy name be so, let me thy servant and not sovereign be. Tis the French Dauphin sueth to thee thus. I must not yield to any rights of love for my profession sacred from above. When I have chased all thy foes from hence, then will I think upon a recompense. Meantime, look gracious on my, thy prostrate throne. My lord, where are you? What device you are not? Shall we give o'er or Leon or no? Why no, I say. Distrustful recreants fight to the last gasp. I'll be your guard. What she says, I'll confirm. We'll fight it out. Assigned am I to be the English scourge. This night, the siege assuredly I'll raise. Expect St. Martin's summer, halcyon day since I have entered into these wars. Glory is like a circle in the water, which never ceaseth to enlarge itself till by broad spreading it dispersed to naught. With Henry's death, the English circle ends. 
dispersed are the glories it included. Now am I like that proud, insulting ship which Caesar and his fortune bear at once. How may I reverently worship thee enough? Oh, leave off delays and let us raise the siege. Woman, do what thou canst to save our honors. Drive them from Orleum and be immortalized. Presently we'll try. Come, let's away about it. No prophet will I trust if she prove false. Exeunt. Act one, scene three. Enter Gloucester with his servingman in blue coat. I am come to survey the tower this day. Since Henry's death, I fear there is conveyance. Where be these waters that they wait not here? Open the gates, tis Gloucester that calls. Who's there who knocks so imperiously? It is the noble Duke of Gloucester. Whoe'er he be, you may not be let in. Villains, answer you so the Lord Protector? The Lord protect him, so we answer him. We do no otherwise than we are willed. Who willed you, or whose will stands but mine? There's none protector of the realm but I. Break up the gates, I'll be your warranties. Shall I be flouted thus by dunghill grooms? What noise is this? What, what traitors have we here? Lieutenant, is it you whose voice I hear? Open the gates, here's Gloucester that would enter. Have patience, noble duke, I'm, I may not open. The Cardinal of Winchester forbids. From him I have expressed commandment that thou nor none of thine shall be let in. Faint-hearted Woodville, prizest him before me? Arrogant Winchester, that haughty prelate, whom Henry, our late sovereign, could ne'er brook? Thou art no friend to God or to the king. Open the gates, or I'll shut thee out shortly. Oh! How now, ambitious Humphrey, what means this? Peeled priest, dost thou command me to be shut out? I do, thou most usurping proditor and not protector of the king or realm. Stand back, thou manifest conspirator, thou that contrivest to murder our dead lord. I'll canvas thee in thy broad cardinal's hat, if thou proceed in this thy insolence. Nay, stand thou back, I will not budge a foot. Draw men for all this privileged place, blue cots to tawny coats. Now beat them hence, thee I'll chase hence, thou wolf in sheep's array. Out, tawny coats! Out, scarlet hypocrite! Fine <laughs> lords, that you being supreme magistrates, thus contumeliously should break the peace! Peace! Mayor, thou knowest little of my wrongs. Here's Beaufort, that regards nor God nor king, hath here distrained the tower to his use. Here's Gloucester, a foe to citizens, one that still motions war and never peace, overcharging your free purses with large fines, that seeks to overthrow religion because he is protector of the realm and would have armor here out of the tower to crown himself king and suppress the prince. I will not answer thee with words, but blows! Oh! Yeah! Oh! Oh! Not rest for me in this too much to a strife, but to make open proclamation. Come, officer, as loud as e'er thou canst, cry! All manner of men assembled here and arms this day against God's peace and the king, we charge and command you in his highness's name to repair to your several dwelling places and not to wear, handle or use any sword, weapon or dagger, henceforward upon pain of death. Cardinal, I'll be no breaker of the law, but we shall meet and break our minds at large. Gloucester will meet to thy cost, be sure. Thy heart blood I will have for this day's work. I'll call for clubs if you will not away. Mayor, farewell. Thou dost but what thou mayest. Abominable Gloucester, guard thy head, for I intend to have it ere long. See the coast cleared, 
and then we will depart. Good God, these nobles should such stomachs bear. I myself fight not once in forty year. Exeunt. Act one, scene four. Enter the master gunner of Orléans and his boy. <laughs> Sirrah, thou knowest how Orléans is besieged, and how the English have the suburbs won. Father, I know, and oft have shot at them. However unfortunate, I missed my aim. But now shalt thou shalt not. Be thou ruled by me. The prince's espials have informed me how the English in the suburbs close entrenched want through a secret gate of iron bars in yonder tower to overpeer the city, and thence discover how with most advantage they may vex us with shot or with assault. To intercept this inconvenience, a piece of ordnance against it I have placed, and even these three days have I watched if I could see them. Now do thou watch, for I can stay no longer. If thou spiest any, Run and bring me word, and thou shalt find me at the governor's. Father, I warrant you, take no care. I'll never trouble you if I may spy them. Talbot! <laughs> joy again returned! Oh, how art thou handled being prisoner, and by what means got thou to be released? The Duke of Bedford had a prisoner called the brave Lord Ponton de Centrier. For him was I exchanged and ransomed. But oh, the treacherous Falstaff wounds my heart, whom with my bare fists I would execute if I now had him brought into my power. Yet tell us not how thou, yet thou tell us not how thou were entertained. <laughs> with scoffs and scorns and contumelious taunts, in open marketplace produced they me to be a public spectacle to all. Here, said they, is the terror of the French, the scarecrow that affrights our children's soul. In iron walls they deemed me not secure. And if I did but stir out of my bed, ready they were to shoot me to the heart. Oh, I grieve to hear what torments you endured, but we will be revenged sufficiently. Now it is supper time in Orleans. Here, through this gate, I count each one and view the Frenchmen how they fortify. Let us look in, the sight will much delight thee. Sir Thomas Gargrave and Sir William Glansdale, let me have your express opinions. Where is the best place to make our battery next? I think the North Gate, for there stands Lords. And I here at the bulwark of the bridge. For aught I see, this city must be famished, or with light skirmishes enfeebled. Lord have mercy on me, waffle man! What chance is this that suddenly hath crossed us? Speak, Salisbury! At least if thou canst, speak! How first thou, mirror of all martial men! Why is in thy cheek side struck off? Cursed tower! A cursed fatal hand that hath contrived this woeful tragedy! Yet lives thou, Salisbury! Though thy speech doth fail, one eye thou hast to look to heaven for grace. The sun with one eye vieweth all the world. Oh, heaven be thou gracious to none alive if Salisbury wants mercy at thy hands. The Thomas Gargrave, hast thou any life? Speak unto Talbot. Nay, look up at him. Bear hence his body. I will help to bury it. Salisbury, cheer thy spirit with this comfort. Thou shalt not die, Watts. He beckons me with his hand and smiles on me. 
as who should say when I am dead and gone, remember to avenge me on the French. Plantagenet, I will. And like thee, Nero, play on the lute, beholding the towns burn. Wretched shall France be only in my name! Where is this? Not on the heavens. Whence cometh this alarm and this noise? Lord, my lord, the French have gathered head, the Dauphin, with one Joan La Pucelle joined, a holy prophetess new risen up. He has come with a great power to raise the siege. Ah! 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 Dying soul breatheth groan. It irks his heart, he cannot be revenged. Frenchman, I'll be a Salisbury to you. Pucelle or Pucelle, dolphin or dogfish, your hearts I'll stamp out with my horse's heels and make a quagmire of your mangled brains. Convey me Salisbury into his tent, and then we'll try what these dastard Frenchmen dare. <laughs> strength, my valour and my force. Our English troops retire, I cannot stay them. A woman clad in armour chaseth them. Here she comes. I'll have a bout with thee, devil or devil's dam. I'll conjure thee. Blood will I draw on thee. Thou art a witch, and straightway give thy soul to him thou servest. Come. Come, tis only I that must disgrace thee. Heavens, can you suffer hell so to prevail? My breast I'll burst with straining of my courage, and from my shoulders crack my arms asunder, but I will chastise this high-minded strumpet! <laughs> Talbot, farewell. Thy hour is not yet come. I must go victual Orléans forthwith. Or takes me, if thou canst, I scorn thy strength. Go, go, cheer up thy hungry, starved men. Help Salisbury to make his testament. This day is ours, as many more shall be. God, my thoughts are whirled like a potter's wheel. I know not where I am, nor what I do. The witch, by fear, not force, like Hannibal, drives back our troops and conquers as she lists. They called us for our fierceness English dogs. Now, like to whelps, we crying run away. Ah! 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 Do the fight or tear the lion out of England's coat! It will not be. Retire into your trenches. You all consented unto Salisbury's death, for none would strike a stroke in his revenge. Purcell is entered into Orléans, in spite of us or aught that we could do. Or would I were to die with Salisbury? Act One, Scene Six. Enter on the walls Joan La Pucelle, Charles, Rainier, Alençon, and soldiers with flags. Advance our waving colours on the walls. Rescued is Orléans from the English. Thus Joan La Pucelle has performed her word. How shall I honour thee for this success? France, triumph in thy glorious prophetess. 
recovered is the town of Orléans, more blessed hapted, ne'er befall our state. Why not ring out the bells aloud throughout the town? Dauphin, command the citizens make bonfires and feast and banquet in the open streets to celebrate the joy that God has given us. All France will be replete with mirth and joy when they shall hear how we have played them. Oh, tis Joan, not we by whom the day is won, for which I will divide my crown with her, and all the priests and friars in my realm shall in procession sing her endless praise. No longer on Saint-Denis will we cry, but Joan La Pucelle shall be France's saint. Come in, and let us banquet royally after this golden day of victory. Victory! <laughs> Act two, scene one. Enter a French sergeant of a band with sentinels on the walls. Sirs, take your places and be vigilant. Thus are poor servitors, when others sleep upon their quiet beds, constrained to watch in darkness, rain and cold. Lord Regent and redoubted Burgundy, by whose approach the regions of Artois, Walloon, and Picardy are friends to us. This happy night, the Frenchmen are secure, having all they caroused and banqueted. Embrace we then this opportunity, as fitting best to quittance their deceit contrived by art and baleful sorcery. Coward of France, how much he wrongs his fame, despairing of his own arms, fortitude, to join with witches at the help of hell. Traitors have never other company. But what's that Pucelle whom they term so pure? A maid, they say. A maid? And be so martial? Pray God she prove not masculine ere long, if underneath the standard of the French she carry armour as she hath, hath begun. Well, let them practice and converse with spirits. God is our fortress, in whose conquering name let us resolve to scale their flinty bullocks. Ascend, brave Talbot, we will follow thee. Not altogether, but better far, I guess, that we do make our entrance several ways. But if it chance the one of us do fail, the other yet may rise against their force. Agreed. I'll to yon corner. And I to this. And here will Talbot mount and will make his grave. Now, Salisbury, for thee and for the right of English Henry, shall this night appear how much in duty I am bound to both. Arm! Arm! The enemy doth make assault! Now, my lord, what? All unready so? I think this Talbot be a fiend of hell. If lord of hell, the heavens sure favour him. Oh, here cometh Charles. I marvel how he sped. Tot, holy dome was his defensive guard. Is this thy cunning, thou deceitful dame? Didst thou, at first, to flatter us with all, make us partakers of a little gain that now our loss might be ten times so much? Wherefore is Charles impatient with his friend? At all times will you have my power alike, sleeping or waking, must I still prevail, or will you blame and lay the fault on me? Improvident soldiers, had your watch been good, this sudden mischief could never have fallen. Duke of Alençon, this was your default, that being captain of the watch tonight did look no better to that weighty charge. Had all your quarters been as safely kept as that whereof I had the government, we had not been thus shamefully surprised. Mine was secure. And so was mine, my lord. Then how or which way should they first break in? Questions, my lord, no further of the case. How or which way, tis sure they found some place, but weakly guarded where the breach was made. And now there rests no other shift but this, to gather our soldiers, scattered and dispersed, and lay new platforms to damage them. <laughs> ah, 
Act two, scene two. Enter Talbot, Bedford, Burgundy, a captain and soldiers. The day begins to break and night is fled whose pitchy mantle over veiled the earth. Hear sound retreat and cease our hot pursuit. Retreat, men. Retreat, retreat. Bring forth the body of old Salisbury. Now have I paid my vow unto his soul. For every drop of blood was drawn from him, there hath at least five Frenchmen died tonight. And that hereafter ages may behold what ruin happened in revenge of him. Within their chiefest temple I'll erect a tomb, wherein his corpse shall be interred. The one the which that everyone may read shall be engraved the sack of Orléans. The treacherous manner of his mournful death, and what a terror he had been to France. But lords, in all our bloody massacre, I muse. We met not with the Dauphin's grace, nor his new come champion, virtuous Joan of Arc, nor any of his false confederates. At his thought, Lord Talbot, when the fight began, roused on the sudden from their drowsy beds, they did amongst the troop of armed men leap o'er the walls for refuge in the field. <laughs> Myself, as far as I could well discern for smoke and dusky vapours of the night, I'm sure I scared the Dauphin and his troll, when arm in arm they came, both swiftly running. All hail, my lords. Which of this princely train call you the warlike Talbot? For his axe so much applauded through the realm of France. Here is the Talbot! <laughs> Who would speak with him? The virtuous lady Countess Auvergne, with modesty admiring thy renown, by me entreats, great lord, thou wast vouchsafe to visit her poor castle where she lies. Is it even so? Nay, then I see our wars will turn into a peaceful comic sport when ladies crave to be encountered with. You may not, my lord, despise her gentle suit. Nay, trust me then. For I return, great thanks, and in submission will attend on her. Will not your honours bear me company? No, oh, truly, tis more than manners will. <laughs> well then alone, since there's no remedy. I mean to prove this, ladies, courtesy. Come hither, Captain. You perceive my mind. I do, my lord. I mean accordingly. Exeunt. Act two, scene three. Enter the Countess of Auvergne and her porter. Porter, remember what I gave in charge, and when you have done so, bring the keys to me. Madam, I will. The plot is laid. If all things fall out right, I shall as famous be by this exploit as Scythian Tomaris by Cyrus's death. Great is the rumor of this dreadful night, and for his achievements of no less account. Fain would mine eyes be witness with mine ears to give their censure of these rare reports. Madame. According as your ladyship desired by message craved, so is Lord Talbot come. And he is welcome. What? Is this the man? Madame, it is. Is this the scourge of France? Is this the Talbot so much feared abroad that with his name the mothers still their babes? I see report is fabulous and false. I thought I should have seen some Hercules, a second Hector, for his grim aspect and large proportion of his strong knit limbs. Alas, this is a child, a silly dwarf. It cannot be this weak and riddled shrimp should strike such terror to his enemies. Madam, I have been bold to trouble you. But since your ladyship is not at leisure, I'll sort some other time to visit you. If thou be he, then art thou prisoner. Prisoner? To whom? To me, 
bloodthirsty lord, and for that cause I trained thee to my house. Long time thy shadow hath been thrall to me, for in my gallery thy picture hangs. But now the substance shall endure the like, and I will chain these legs and arms of thine that hast by tyranny these many years wasted our country, slain our citizens, and sent our sons and husbands captivate. <laughs> Last thou, wretch, thy mirth shall turn to moan. I laugh to see your ladyship so fond to think that you have aught but Talbot's shadow whereon to practice your severity. Why? Art thou not the man? I am indeed. Then I have substance too. Oh no. I am but shadow of myself. You are deceived. My substance is not here. For what you see is but the smallest part and least proportion of humanity. I tell you, madam, for the whole frame here, it is of such a spacious, lofty pitch, your roof were not sufficient to contain it. This is a riddling merchant for the nonce. He will be here, and yet he is not here. How can these contrarieties agree? <laughs> that will I show you presently. How say you, madam? Are you now persuaded that Talbot is but shadow of himself? These are his substance, sinews, arms and strength, with which he yoketh your rebellious necks, raiseth your cities and subverts your towns, and in a moment makes them desolate. Victorious Talbot, pardon my abuse. I find thou art no less than fame hath bruited, and more than may be gathered by thy shape. Let my presumption not provoke thy wrath, for I am sorry that with reverence I did not entertain thee as thou art. What you have done hath not offended me, nor other satisfaction do I crave, but only with your patience that we may... Uh, taste of your wine, and see what cates you have, for soldiers' stomachs always serve them well. With all my heart, and think me honoured to feast so great a warrior in my house. <laughs> Exeunt. Act two, scene four. Enter Richard Plantagenet, Warwick, Somerset, <laughs> Suffolk, Vernon, a lawyer, and other gentlemen. Great lords and gentlemen, what means this silence? There no man answer in a case of truth. Within the temple hall we were too loud. The garden here is more convenient. Then say at once if I maintain the truth, or else was wrangling Somerset in the error. Faith, I have been truant in the law, and never yet could frame my will to it, and therefore frame the law unto my will. Judge you, my lord of Warwick, then between us. Between two hawks, which flies the higher pitch. I have perhaps some shallow spirit of judgment, but in these nice sharp quillets of the law, good faith, I am no wiser than a door. Tut, tut, there is a mannerly forbearance. The truth appears so naked on my side that any purblind eye may find it out. And on my side, it is so well apparelled, so clear, so shining and so evident that it will glimmer through a blind man's eye. Let him that is a true-born gentleman and stands upon the honour of his birth, if he suppose that I have pleaded truth, from off this briar pluck a white rose with me. Let him that is no coward nor no flatterer, but dare maintain the party of the truth, pluck a red rose from off this thorn with me. I love no colours. And without all colour of base insinuating flattery, I pluck this white rose with plantation. <laughs> I pluck this red rose with young Somerset, and say withal I think he held the right. Stay, lords and gentlemen, and pluck no more till you conclude that he upon whose side the fewest roses are cropped from the tree shall yield the other in the right opinion. 
Good Master Vernon, it is well objected. If I have fewest, I subscribe in silence. And I. Then, for truth and plainness of the case, I pluck this pale and maiden blossom here, giving my verdict on the white rose side. Take not your finger as you pluck it off, lest mm. bleeding you do paint the white rose red and fall on my side so against your will. If I, my lord, for my opinion bleed, opinion shall be surgeon to my hurt, and keep me on the side where still I am. Well, well, come on, who else? Unless my study and my books be false, the argument you held was wrong in you. In sign whereof, I pluck a white rose. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> now, Somerset, where is your argument? <laughs> Here, in my scabbard, meditating that shall dye your white rose in a bloody red. Meantime, your cheeks do counterfeit our roses. For pale they look with fear, as witnessing the truth on our side. No, Plantagenet, tis not for fear, but anger, that thy cheeks blush for pure shame to counterfeit our roses, and yet thy tongue will not confess thy error. Now, by this maiden blossom in my hand, I scorn thee in thy fashion, peevish boy. Turn not not thy scorns this way, Plantagenet. Cloud pole, I will, and scorn both him and thee. <laughs> I'll turn my part thereof into thy throat. Away, away, good Willem de la Pole. We grace the yeoman by conversing with him. Now, by God's will, thou wrongest him, Somerset. He bears him on the place's privilege, or durst not, for his craven heart says thus. By him that made me, I'll maintain my words on any plot of ground in Christendom. Was not thy father, Richard Earl of Cambridge, for treason executed in <laughs> our late king's day? His trespass yet lives guilty in thy blood, and till thou be before thou art a yeoman. My father was attached, not attainted, condemned to die for treason, but no traitor. And that I'll prove on better men than Somerset. Ah, thou shalt find us ready for thee still, and know us by these colours for thy foes. For these my friends in spite of thee shall wear. And by my soul, this pale and angry rose, as cognizance of my blood-drinking hate, will I forever, and my faction, wear it until it wither with me to my grave, or flourish to the height of my degree. Go forward and be choked with thy ambition, and so farewell until I meet thee next. Have with thee, Pole. Farewell, ambitious Richard. Oh! How am I brave that must perforce endure it? This blot that they object against your house shall be wiped out in the next parliament. And if thou not be then created York, I will not live to be accounted Warwick. Meantime, in signal of my love to thee against proud Somerset and William Pole, will I upon this party wear thy rose. And here I prophesy, this brawl today shall send between the red rose and the white a thousand souls to death and deadly night. Good Master Vernon, I am bound to you that you on my behalf would pluck a flower. In your behalf still will I wear the same. And so will I. Thanks, gentle sir. Come, let us fall to dinner. I dare say this quarrel will drink blood another day. Exeunt. Act two, scene five. Enter Mortimer and jailers. Kind keepers of my weak, decaying age, let dying Mortimer here rest himself. These eyes, like lamps whose wasting oil is spent, wax dim as drawing to their exigent. But tell me, Keeper, will my nephew come? Richard Plantagenet, my lord, will come. We sent unto the temple, unto his chamber, and answer was returned that he will come. Enough. My soul shall then be satisfied. Poor gentleman, his wrong doth equal mine. Since Henry Monmouth first began to reign, before whose glory I was great in arms. This loathsome sequestration have I had. And ever since then, 
hath Richard been obscured, deprived of honour and inheritance? I would his troubles likewise were expired, that so he might recover what was lost. My lord, your loving nephew now is come. Richard Plantagenet, my friend, is he come? Aye, noble uncle, thus ignobly used. Your nephew, late despised Richard, comes. Oh, direct mine arms. I may embrace his neck and in his bosom spend my latter gasp. And now declare, sweet stem from York's great stock. Why didst thou say of late thou wert despised? This day, an argument upon a case, some words there grew twixt Somerset and me, among which terms he used his lavish tongue and did upbraid me with my father's death, which obloquy set bars before my tongue, else with the like I had requited him. Therefore, good uncle, for my father's sake, in honour of a true Plantagenet, and for reliance sake, declare the cause my father, Earl of Cambridge, lost his head. Ah, oh, that cause, fair nephew, that imprisoned me, and hath detained me all my flowering youth within a loathsome dungeon there to pine, was cursed instrument of his decease. Discover more at large what cause that was. I will, if that my fading breath permit, and death approach not ere my tale be done. Henry, the fourth, grandfather to this king, deposed his nephew Richard, during whose reign the Percy's of the North, finding his usurpation most unjust, endeavoured my advancement to the throne. The reason moved these warlike laws to this was for that. Young Richard, Thus removed, leaving no heir begotten of his body, I was the next by birth and parentage. But mark, as in this haughty great attempt they laboured to plant the rightful heir, I lost my liberty and they their lives. Long after this, when Henry V, succeeding his father Bolingbroke, did reign. Thy father, Earl of Cambridge then, derived from famous Edmund Langley, Duke of York, marrying my sister that thy mother was, again in pity of my hard distress, levied an army, weaning to redeem and have installed me in the garden. But as the rest, so fell that noble earl, and was beheaded. Thus the Mortimers, in whom the title rested, were suppressed. Of which, my lord, your honour is the last. True. And thou, seest that I have no issue and that my fainting words do warrant death. Thou art my heir. The rest I wish thee gather, but yet be wary in thy studious care. Thy grave admonishments prevail with me, but yet methinks my father's execution was nothing less than bloody tyranny. With silence, nephew, be thou politic. Strong fixed is the house of Lancaster, and like a mountain not to be removed. But now thy uncle is removing it. Oh, uncle. Would some part of my young years might but redeem the passage of your age? 
thou dost wrong me. As that slaughter doth which giveth many wounds, when one will kill. Mourn not, except thou sorrow for my good. Only give order for my funeral. And so, farewell. And fair be all thy hopes, and prosperous be thy life in peace and war. And peace, no war before thy parting soul. Well, I will lock his counsel in my breast, and what I do imagine, let that rest. Keepers, convey him hence. And I myself will see his burial better than his life. Here dies the dusky torch of Mortimer, choked with ambition of the meaner sort. And for those wrongs, those bitter injuries which Somerset hath offered to my house, I doubt not but with honour to redress. And therefore, haste I to the Parliament, either to be restored to my blood or make my ill the advantage of my good. Exit. Act three, scene one. Enter the King, Exeter, Gloucester, Winchester, Warwick, Somerset, Suffolk, Richard Plantagenet, and others. I yeah, completely yeah, disagree yeah. with you. Nonsense. This is absolutely no. absurd. Oh, comest thou with deep premeditated lines, with written pamphlets studiously devised. Humphrey of Gloucester, if thou canst accuse or aught intendest to lay unto my charge, do it with invention. Suddenly, as I with sudden and extemporal speech purpose to answer what thou canst object presumptuous priest this place commands my patience or thou shouldst find thou hast dishonored me thou art a most pernicious usurer forward <laughs> by nature enemy to peace lascivious wanton more than well beseems a man of thy profession and degree and for thy treachery what's more manifest in that thou laidest a trap to take my life as well at london bridge as at the tower besides I fear me, if thy thoughts were sifted, the king, thy sovereign, is not quite exempt from envious malice of thy swelling heart. Gloucester, I do defy thee, Lord, ah! Lord, safe to give me hearing what I shall reply. If I were covetous, ambitious, or perverse, as he will have me, how am I so poor? Or how haps it I seek not to advance or raise myself, but keep my wanted calling? And for dissension, who prefereth peace more than I do, except I be provoked? No, my good lords, it is not that offends, it is because no one should sway but he. No one should be about the king, and that engenders thunder in his breast and makes him roar those accusations forth. But he shall know I am as good. As good? Thou bastard of my grandfather! Hi, <laughs> lordly sir! For what are you, I pray, but one imperious in another's throne? Am I not protector, saucy priest? And am I not prelate of the church? Yes, as an outlaw in a castle keeps, and useth it to patronage his theft. <laughs> Unreverent Gloucester! Thou art reverend, touching thy spiritual function, not thy life! Rome shall remedy this. Rome thither then. My lord, it were your duty to forbear. I see the bishop be not overborne. And methinks my lord should be religious and know the office that belongs to such. Methinks his lordship should be humbler. It fitteth not a prelate so to plead. Yes, when his holy state is touched so near. State holy or unhallowed, what of that? Is not his grace protector to the king? Plantagenet, I see, must hold his tongue, lest it be said 
Speak, sirrah, when you should. Must your bold verdict enter talk with lords? Else I would have a fling at Winchester. Uncles of Gloucester and of Winchester, the special watch watchmen of our English wheel, I would prevail if prayers might prevail to join your hearts in love and amity. Oh, what a scandal it is to our crown that two such peers as ye should jar. Believe me, lords, my years are tender and can tell that civil dissension is a viperous worm that gnaws the bowels of the commonwealth. Down with, with the tourney coats! Down with the tourney coats! What tumult is this? An uproar, I dare warrant, begun through malice of the bishop's men. Stones! 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 <laughs> oh, my good lords and virtuous Henry, pity the city of London. Pity us, the bishop and the Duke of Gloucester's men, forbidden late to carry any weapon, have filled their pockets full of pebble stones, and banding themselves in contrary parts to pelt so fast at one another's pate that many have their giddy brains knocked out. Yeah! 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 Pray, Uncle Gloucester, mitigate this strife. Nay, if we be forbidden stones, we'll fall to it with our teeth. Do what ye dare. We are as resolute. Yeah. Oh. My household, leave this peevish quarrel oh. and set this unaccustomed fight aside. My lord, we know your grace to be a man just and upright. And for your royal birth, we and our wives and children all will fight and have our bodies slaughtered by the foes. Aye and the very parings of our nails shall pitch a field when we are dead. <gasps> stay, stay, I say. Oh, how this poor doth afflict my soul. Can you, my lords of Winchester, behold my sighs and tears and will not once relent? Who should be pitiful if you be not, or who should study to prefer a peace if holy churchmen take delight in broils? Yield, my lord protector, yield, Winchester. Except you mean with obstinate repulse to slay your sovereign and destroy the realm. He shall submit, or I will never yield. Compassion on the king commands me stoop, or I will see his heart out ere the priest should ever get that privilege of me. Behold, my lord of Winchester, the duke hath banished moody, discontented fury, as by his smoothed brows it doth appear. Why look you still so stern and tragical. Here, Winchester, I offer thee my hand. Hi, oh. oh. Uncle Beaufort. I've heard you preach that malice was a great and grievous sin. And will you not maintain the thing you teach, but choose a, but prove a chief offender in the same? Sweet king, the bishop have a kindly gird. For shame, my lord of Winchester, relent. What? Shall a child instruct you what to do? Well, Duke of Gloucester, I will yield to thee. Love for thy love, and a hand for a hand I give. Aye, but I fear me with a hollow heart. See here, my friends and loving countrymen, this token serveth for a flag of truce betwixt ourselves and all our followers. So help me God, as I dissemble not. So help me God, as I intended not. Oh, loving uncle, kind Duke of Gloucester, how joyful am I made by this contract. Away, my masters, trouble us no more, but join in friendship as your lords have done. Content, I'll to the surgeons. So will I. And I will see what physic the tavern affords. <laughs> Accept this scroll, most gracious sovereign, which in the right of Richard Plantagenet we do exhibit to your majesty. Well urged, my lord of Warwick, for sweet prince, and if your grace mark every circumstance, you have great reason to do Richard right. And those occasions, uncle, were a force. Therefore, my loving lords, our pleasure is that Richard be restored to his blood. <laughs> Let Richard be restored to his blood! So shall his father's wrongs be recompensed. As will the rest, so willeth Winchester. If Richard will be true, not that alone, but all the whole inheritance I give, 
that doth belong into the house of York, from whence you spring by lineal descent. Thy humble servant vows obedience and humble service till the point of death. Stoop then and set your knee against my foot, and regurging done of that duty done, I girt thee with the valiant sword of York. Rise, Richard, like a true Plantagenet, and rise, created princely Duke of York. And so thrive, Richard, as thy foes may fall. As my duty springs, so perish they that grudge one thought against your majesty. Welcome, Welcome high prince, prince my the mighty duke, duke of York. York. Perish, base prince, ignoble duke of York. Now will it best avail your majesty to cross the seas and be crowned in France. The presence of a king engenders love amongst his servants and his subjects and his loyal friends as it disanimates his enemies. When Gloucester says the word, King Henry goes, for friendly counsel cuts off many people. Your ships already are in readiness. <laughs> We may march in England or in France, not seeing what is likely to ensue. This late dissension grown betwixt the peers burns under feigned ashes of, of forged love, and will at last break out into a flame. And now I fear that fatal prophecy, that Henry born at Monmouth should win all, and Henry born at Windsor should lose all, which is so plain that Exeter doth wish his days may finish ere that hapless time. Exit. Act three, scene two. Enter Joan Lapoucelle, disguised, with a soldier dressed like a countryman with a sack upon their back. These are the city gates, the gates of Rouen, through which our policy must make a breach. Take heed, be wary how you place your words. Talk like the vulgar sort of market men that come to gather money for their corn. If we have entrance, as I hope we shall, and that we find the slothful watch but weak, I'll by a sign give notice to our friends that Charles the Dauphin may encounter them. Killer! En passant, les pauvres gens de France, poor market folks that come to sell their corn. Enter, go in, the market bell has rung. Now, Rouen, I'll shake thy bullocks to the ground. Saint-Denis bless this happy stratagem, and once again we'll sleep secure in Rouen. Here, oh. here entered Pucelle in her practice on. Now she is there. How will we specify which is the best and safest passage in? By thrusting out a torch from yonder tower. Hmm? Behold, this is the happy wedding torch that joineth Rouen unto her countrymen by burning fatal to the Talbotites. See, noble charge, the, the, the beacon of our friend, the burning torch in yonder turret stands. Now shine it like a comet of revenge, a prophet to the fall of all our foes. The fur no time, delays of dangerous ends, enter and cry, the Dauphin presently, and then to execution on the woods. <laughs> France, thou shalt rue this treason with thy tears. Purcell, that witch, that damned and sorceress, hath wrought this hellish mischief unawares that hardly we escape the pride of France. <laughs> Enter Talbot and Burgundy without. Within, Joan Lapoucelle, Charles, the Bastard, Alençon, and Rainier on the walls. Good morrow, gallants. Want ye corn for bread? I think the Duke of Burgundy will fast before he'll buy again at such a rate. Go on, thou fiend and shameless courtesan. I trust ere long to choke thee with thine own, and make thee curse the harvest of that corn. Oh, your grace may starve, perhaps, before that time. Oh, let no words but deeds revenge this treason. What will you do, good Greybeard? Break a lance and run a tilt at death within a chair? 
foul fiend of France and hag of all despite, encompassed with thy lustful paramours, becomes it thee to taunt his valiant age and twit with cowardice a man half dead? Damsel, I'll have a bout with you again, or else let Talbus perish with his shame! Are you so hot, sir? Yet, Gusell, hold thy peace. If Talbot do but thunder, rain will follow. Godspeed the Parliament. Who shall be the speaker? Dare ye come forth and meet us in the field? But like your lordship takes us then for fools, to try if that our own be ours or no. I speak not to that railing Hecate, but unto thee, Alençon, and the rest, will ye, like soldiers, come and fight it out? Senor, no. Senor, hang! Base muleteers of France! Away, captains, let's get us from the walls, for Talbot means no goodness by his looks. Goodbye, my lord. We came but to tell you that we are here. <clears throat> and there will we be too, ere it be long. <sighs> Val Burgundy. By honour of thy house, I to get the town again or die. And I, as sure as English Henry lives, so sure I swear to get the town or die. My vows are equal partners with thy vows. But there we go. Regard this dying prince. The valiant Duke of Bedford. Come, my lord. We will bestow you in some better place, fitter for sickness and for crazy age. Lord Talbot. Do not so dishonour me. Here will I sit before the walls of Rouen and will be partner of your weal or woe. On a daunted spirit in a dying breast. And be it so. Heavens, keep old Bedford safe. And now, no more adieu, brave Burgundy, but gather we our forces out of hand and set upon our boasting enemy. Enter Sir John Falstaff and the captain. Such haste! Whither away? To save myself by flight? We are like to have to overthrow again. What, will you leave and fly and leave Lord Talbot? Aye. All the Talbots in the world to save my life. Cowardly knight! Ill fortune follow me! No. Quiet soul. Depart when heaven please, for I have seen our enemies overthrow. What is the trust of strength of foolish men that they that of late were daring with their scoffs are glad and fain by flight to save themselves? <laughs> Lost and recovered in a day again! This is a double honour, Burgundy. Yet heavens have glory for this victory. Warlike and martial Talbot, Burgundy enshrines thee in his heart and there erects thy noble deeds as valour's monuments. Thanks, gentle Duke. But where is Purcell now? Now where's the bastard's brave? And Charles, his Gleeks? What? <laughs> All a mort? Ruon hangs her head for grief that such a valiant company are fled. <laughs> now, will we take some order of the town, placing therein some expert officers and then depart to Paris to the king, for there young Henry with his nobles lie. What wills Lord Talbot pleaseth Burgundy? But yet, before we go, let's not forget the noble Duke of Bedford, late deceased, but see his exequies fulfilled in Rouen. A braver soldier never couched lance. But kings and mightiest potentates must die. For that's the end of human misery. Excellent.
Act three, scene three, enter Charles, the bastard, Alençon, Joan La Pucelle, and soldiers. Dismay not, princes, at this accident, nor grieve that Rouen is so recovered. Care is no cure, but rather corrosive for things that are not to be remedied. Let frantic Talbot triumph for a while, and like a peacock sweep, al sweep along his tail. We'll pull his plumes and take away his train, if Dauphin and the rest will be but ruled. We have been guided by thee hitherto, and of thy cunning hand had no diffidence. One sudden foil shall never breed distrust. Then it must, then thus it must be. This doth Joan devise. By fair persuasions, mixed with sugared words, we will entice the Duke of Burgundy to leave the Talbot and to follow us. Ay, Mary, sweeting, if we could do that, France were no place for Henry's warriors. Nor should that nation boast it so with us, but be extirped from our provinces. Or ever should they be expulsed from France and not have title of an earldom here. Your honors shall perceive how I will work to bring this matter to the wished end. Hark, by the sound of drum you may perceive their powers are marching unto Paris word. Uh, there goes the Talbot with his colors spread and all the troops of English after him. Now in the rearward comes the duke and his fortune and favor makes him lag behind. Summon a parley, we will talk with him. A parley with the Duke of Burgundy! Who craves a parley with the Burgundy? The princely Charles of France, thy countryman. What sayest thou, Charles, for I am marching hence? Speak, Pucelle, and enchant him with thy words. Brave Burgundy. Undoubted hope of France. Stay, let thy humble handmaid speak to thee. Oh, speak on, but be not over tedious. Look on thy country, look on fertile France, and see the cities and the towns defaced by wasting ruin of the cruel foe. As looks the mother on her lowly babe when death doth close his tender dying eyes. See, see the pining malady of France. Behold the wounds, the most unnatural wounds, which thou thyself hast given her woeful breast. Oh, turn thy edged sword another way. Strike those that hurt and hurt not those that help. One drop of blood drawn from thy country's bosom should grieve thee more than streams of foreign gore. Return thee therefore with a flood of tears and wash away thy country's stained spots. Either she hath bewitched me with her words or nature makes me suddenly relent. Besides, all French and France exclaims on thee, doubting thy birth and lawful progeny. Who joinest thou with, but with a lordly nation, that will not trust thee, but for profit's sake? When Talbot hath set footing once in France, and fashion thee that instrument of ill, who then but English Henry will be lord, and thou be thrust out like a fugitive? Call we to mind, and mark but this for proof, was not the Duke of Orléans thy foe? And was he not an England prisoner? But when they heard he was thine enemy, they set him free without his ransom paid, in spite of Burgundy and all his friends. See then, thou fightest against thy countrymen, and joinst with them will be thy slaughtermen. Come, come, return, return, thou wandering lord. Charles and the rest will take thee in their arms. I am vanquished. These haughty words of hers have battered me like roaring cannon shot and made me almost yield upon my knees. Forgive me, country and sweet countrymen, and lords, accept this hearty, kind embrace. My forces and my power of men are yours, so farewell, Talbot, I'll no longer trust thee. Done like a Frenchman, turn and turn again. Welcome, brave Duke, thy friendship makes us fresh. And doth beget new courage in our breasts. Pucelle hath bravely played her part in this, and doth deserve a coronet of gold. And now let us on, my lords, and join our powers, and seek how we may prejudice the foe. Exeunt, Act Three, Scene Four. Enter the King, Gloucester, Winchester, Richard, Duke of York, Suffolk, Somerset, Warwick, Exeter, Vernon, Bassett, and other courtiers, to them with his soldiers, Talbot. My gracious Prince, and honourable peers, 
Hearing of your arrival in this realm, I have a while given truce unto my wars to do my duty to my sovereign. And with submissive loyalty of heart ascribed the glory of his conquest got first to my God and next unto your God. Is this the Lord Talbot, Uncle Gloucester, that hath so long been resident in France? Yes, if it please your majesty, my liege. Welcome, brave captain and victorious lord. When I was young, as yet I am not old, I do remember how my father said, a stouter champion never handled a sword. Therefore stand up, and there, for these good desserts, we create you Earl of Shrewsbury, and in our coronation take your place. <laughs> Now, sir, to you that were so hot at sea, disgracing of these colours that I wear in honour of my noble Lord of York, darest thou maintain the former words thou spakest? Yes, sir, as well as you dare patronage the envious barking of your saucy tongue against my Lord, the Duke of Somerset. Sirrah, thy Lord, I honour as he is. Why, what is he, as good a man as York? Hark ye not so. In witness, take ye that. Oh, villains! Thou knowest the law of arms is such that those who, who so draws a sword to his present death, or else this blow, should broach thy dearest blood. But I'll unto his majesty, and crave I may have liberty to avenge this wrong. When thou shalt see, I'll meet thee to thy cost. Well, miscreant, I'll be there as soon as you and after meet you sooner than you would. Exeunt. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is our interval. Please take 10 minutes now to refresh your drinks, refresh yourselves. Tweet at Sir Pat Stew to let him know what we've got going on here as well, if you've got time to do that. Uh, actors, if you would like to take a break, now is your chance. Otherwise, feel free to come and join me and Sarah on the chat as we're going to look at some of the questions that have been sent in by our audience during the first half. Over to you, Sarah. Okay, so we've had lots of lovely questions. Thank you so much, everyone on the chat. It's so lovely to see you and, and uh, hear you through digital means. Um, so, right, um, uh, we've had a couple of questions about the action in the show. So um, uh, we've been asked, how did the actors find it to keep up the energy um, given so much action? Anyone want to jump in? <laughs> I feel that's probably a good one for you to start with, Kristin and oh, Jessica. Man. I feel like you guys have the hardest job there. Uh, um, I mean, like, I, I'm, I'm going to be a, a Shakespeare nerd here and go, I think Shakespeare gives you all the energy you need. You just, you know, it, it's there in the text. You know, you just try not to sort of get in its way. There's so much juicy language, you know, and there's so much stuff you can spit and, you know, and these lovely big open vowels. So when you're yelling, you know, you can get it in your back and your body and it feels very... I don't know, to me, it actually feels like, you know, um, helping you. you don't need to be, uh, you know, kind of like pulling energy up from yourself. At least I don't. Maybe I just drink too much coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Jess, but what about you? Yeah, it, um, like Kristen said, just using the language and for me, just thinking of it, if I were uh, doing this on stage, then I would be going into that fight. So I exit camera fighting. <laughs> And then, you know, the, uh, the stunt actors are doing that part of it. And then I return with the energy that they have used. Um, so just really thinking that we are kind of mind melded. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it all together. I've got to give full props to our French contingent as well, who came on full of the fullest of beans for their scenes. It was absolutely cracking. Uh, you got some really great uh, feedback from our audience. They were loving the French, which is not, I think, the first idea that Shakespeare would have had about this play. <laughs> I think Talbot needs to be more likable. <laughs> <laughs> what further questions do we have, Sarah? So we've got a couple kind of around time, which I might just lump in together. So on the action, it was how much time did we have to plan the action um, and how much rehearsal did we have? <laughs> Anyone want to jump in? <laughs> I would say the short answer is uh, not much time. Um, <laughs> uh, so we've had about, I think, about three days, would you guys say, 
um, to, to basically put this all together, but due to everyone's different time zones and different availabilities, um, it's basically little pockets of time that we try and get everyone together. Um, uh, so there's, there's a lot of bits that are, are very fresh. Uh, we never run the show. Um, so everything is done in isolation. So this is the first time we're all together doing the whole thing, uh, which is absolutely brilliant. Um, I think in terms of the action, um, actually, I don't know if Yarrett and Enrique um, are still around. Maybe you want to talk a little bit about the fight stuff would be good and how you kind of rehearse that in. Let's see if, if they're not there, we can move on to another question and come back. To I them. Can see oh, them. yes, you are. There you are. <laughs> yes. Um, well, it kind of started in, in like uh, we chatted with Rob and we got um, some ideas regarding where you guys want the action happening. And then we went, we got notes from our lovely directors and we went away, created some material and then we met the actors. And then obviously with how it works for the actors, then we try and do a bit of this. And um, yeah, but I'm, yeah, it's been but it's it, yeah, it's been over the last three days. Yeah, I mean, I think we had yeah. the first meeting on, on, on Sunday, Sunday, and then yeah, great You just have to roll with it. <laughs> <laughs> so true, so true. I've got a, a question here for Sam. Sam, uh, we've been asked, is that your real hair? <laughs> yes, that is my real hair. This is yeah. amazing. I love it. Love it. <laughs> very regal <laughs> cool um so uh we've got um let's see oh yeah so there's a question around um uh, because i think th this play particularly um in its entirety as part one um isn't often performed so uh someone asked have um have you seen or read the play before if not how did you familiarize with the plot and, and how to approach working on characterization with something that's a, a little bit less familiar? Charlotte, do you want to take that one? Well, there was a very uh, specific and detailed um, map uh, that was delivered to all of us and that I sent to my friends so they could prepare uh, of all the loyalties and um, on the French and the English side and the divisions on the English side. So, um, which came from Shakespeare's words. That's right, yes. Ben Crystal's Shakespeare's yeah. words .com. Very worth a visit for fellow Shakespeare nerds. Yes, and I had to watch a few documentaries too. <laughs> <laughs> Complicated. Anyone else? <laughs> I think one thing I will say actually is when um, we did a, a read through sort of before the casting, um, it's that classic thing of if you read this play particularly, I think the the Henry VI, you know, on paper, it is really hard to follow it and to make head nor tail of everyone's individual journeys as different mm -hmm. characters. But as soon as we got into the first rehearsal and heard everyone bring it to life with their own individuality, suddenly it just clicked for me. Um, and I think it just prove that point again and again that Shakespeare really needs to be performed it needs to be out loud and and, and brought to life rather than just being those words on the page absolutely uh, so we've got a related question here I think this would be a good one for Ema Ema if you're with us uh, it would be great uh, to get your take on how historically accurate is the play okay can everyone hear me yes great one wonderbar um okay so really I, well, a lot of Shakespeare, Shakespeare's plays, well, you can't really, uh, how do I put it, like um, rely on them as a barometer of historical accuracy. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when you look at, say, like a late, much later play, like Cymbeline, like, that moves from medieval Britain, and then you're in the Renaissance Italy, and then you're in medieval Britain again, yeah, and, then you've, and then you also have the Romans. And there's also as well, um, so for example, with Titus Andronicus, there is the, I don't know if anyone's familiar with the, um, the there's a Henry Peachum um, etching, a, a drawing of a performance of Titus Andronicus. And, and it's clear that from, from this drawing, with the mixture of different styles of dress, that um, there were, that 
um, um, the players at the time, they were doing their own version of modern dress, if that makes sense. Yeah, of so course. It, it, yeah, it, yeah. It, it, that's a good way of explaining it. Yeah. So in the case of Shakespeare, so we have a few, he's working from a few sources with these plays. And of course, you know, the first one that comes to mind is Hollinshed. So Hollinshed's Chronicles um, is the source for a lot of these plays. But of course, with Hollinshed and of course with the plays as well, like, you know, there's, um, you know, there's been a, little, a bit of difference and, you know, especially with Shakespeare's plays, you know, you know, it's, I mean, you know, I mean, if I was going to go straight to the historical inaccuracies of this play alone, we might be here all night. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think you kind know? of sums up the answer, really. There's definitely, yeah, there's a lot of yeah. historical inaccuracy, for sure, for yeah. sure. I'd like to now just yeah. give a shout out uh, from one of our uh, audience members. It said, the sound effects. How have you thought of these and incorporated these? So, uh, Richard Hand, if you are there, we'd like to give you a hand. Richard Hand, everybody. I am. <laughs> there he is. <laughs> Wonderful. That's nice. I'm glad people uh, are hearing them. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Hearing them and enjoying them indeed. Yeah, one disappeared at one point. The system crashed, but I, you should have seen me. I was very fast. I got it working again. So. Oh, absolutely, mate. Absolutely. And didn't skip a beat on the next one either. So, you know, it is live. This is live, people. This is what happens with live technology. Technology, unfortunately, is not as predictable as just walking out of a door onto the stage. We wish it was. <laughs> Uh, but yes, no, great work, mate. We've been really enjoying all the atmosphere that that's been bringing to it. So thank you so much. Uh, just quickly, actually, Rob, if I can steal the questions for a minute to do a yeah. little thank you for our patrons. Absolutely, you can. Yes. Yes. 100%. So um, we've had a bunch of people sign up to the Patreon, which is absolutely wonderful. We so appreciate your contributions. Um, so I, I just want to do a quick shout out uh, for the new patrons we've had since last week. So I'll do a quick roll call. So we've got Lynn K, Ruth L, Gary P, Maria H, Linda K, Matthias C, TY, Esther L, Emma B, Debbie G, Theo C, Madeline T, Amber D.A., um, Agnes, Matthew D.T., A.A., Natasha K., uh, Elise May, A uh, M., <laughs> uh, Emily O., uh, Priya, Phyllis K., Joe W., Rose H., Zoe L., Jennifer V., Carrie S., Christopher G., and PJ. <laughs> What They're an massive. overwhelming amount of support. Thank, thank you so you much, so people. Much. Thank you, thank Sorry. you so much. So just to talk quickly about the Patreon, we've set it up as an opt-in hardship fund for our actors. So if any actors that are taking part in this uh, are struggling financially as a result of losing work from uh, the situation that's ongoing, uh, then they can opt in to receive a share of your donation. So if you would like to donate, uh, please check out the Patreon page in the description of this video. Thank you so much. So I think we will make that our two minute call now, two minute call. So we might have time just to sneak in uh, a couple more questions. One interesting one that I saw was uh, for uh, Joan of Arc. What is Joan of Arc fighting for? Um, going back to historical inaccuracies of the play, I'm a huge Joan of Arc nerd, uh, which Rob did not know before casting me in this. Um, so her part is, is very much not historically accurate. I mean, she did kind of save the day at Orléans, but um, I think, so it's hard coming f to this part with uh, such great love for her as a person and then how she kind of has to be a bad guy in this play because she's French. Um, and, but meeting those two together, she's fighting for her love of country. She just loves France so much. And, um, you know, she can be depicted in this play as kind of conniving and everything, but she's always doing it, which we'll see more in the second act. Um, she's doing it because she loves her country so much. Um, and, and that's, and she's trying to appeal to Burgundy uh, with his love of country, you know, trying to appeal uh, to the Dauphin of allowing her to come um, to be her, to be his general or her general in this case. Um, for, for love of country. And so I just always try to bring it back to that. Nice, nice. Uh, and then we have one final, very quick one. Uh, would the Bishop of Winchester like a fan club? Uh, hashtag saucy priest. <laughs> 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 We've got a feeling our, um, 
Oh, what's the Phoebe Waller Bridge flea bag? Yeah, I've yeah, got yeah, yeah. Getting Thank flea you, bag undertones Phoebe in the and, comments. Uh, Andrew Scott for laying the groundwork there. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. All right. So actors, if we've got to ask you now to please uh, kill your cameras, we are about to begin uh, our second half of Henry VI, part one in just a matter of moments. Thank you all so much. And ladies and gentlemen, please enjoy the second half of Henry VI, part one. Act four, scene one. Enter the King, Gloucester, Winchester, Richard, Duke of York, Suffolk, Somerset, Warwick, Talbot, Exeter, the Governor of Paris, and others. Lord Bishop, set the crown upon his head. God save King Henry, of that name, the sixth. God save the king. God save the king. God save the king. God save the king. Now, Governor of Paris, take your oath that you elect no other king but him, esteem none friends but such are as his friends, and none your foes but such as are shall pretend malicious practices against his state. This shall ye do, so help you righteous God. My, my gracious sovereign, as I rode from Calais to haste unto your coronation, a letter was delivered to my hands, writ to your grace from the Duke of Burgundy. Shame to the Duke of Burgundy and thee. I vowed, base knight, when I did meet thee next, to tear the garter from thy craven's leg. Which I have done, because unworthily thou wast installed in that high degree. Pardon me, princely Henry and the rest. This dastard! at the Battle of Pate, like to a trusty squire, did run away. In which assault we lost 1,200 men. Myself and divers gentlemen beside were there surprised and taken prisoners. When first this order was ordained, my lords, knights of the garter, were of noble birth, valiant and virtuous, full of haughty courage, not fearing death, nor shrinking from distress, but always resolute in most extremes. He, then, that is not furnished in this sort, doth but usurp the sacred name of night. Stain to thy countrymen, thou hearest thy doom. Be packing, therefore, that thou that wast a knight. Henceforth we banish thee on pain of death. And now, Lord Protector, read the letter, sent from our uncle Duke of Burgundy. I have upon a special cause moved with compassion of my country's rack, together with the pitiful complaints of such as your oppression feeds upon, forsaken your pernicious faction and joined with Charles, the rightful King of France. What? Doth my uncle Burgundy revolt? He doth, my lord, and is become your foe. But the worst this letter doth contain? It is the worst, and all, my lord, he writes. Why then, Lord Talbot, there shall talk with him and give him chastisement for this abuse? How say you, my lord, are you not content? Content, my liege, yes, but that I am prevented, I should have begged I might have been employed. And gather strength and march unto him straight. Let him perceive how ill Brookley took his treason and what offense it is to flout his friends. Go, oh, my lord, in heart desiring still, you may be held confusion of your foes. Grant me the combat, gracious sovereign. And me, my lord, grant me the combat too. This is my servant, hear him, noble prince. And this is mine, sweet Henry, favor him. Be patient, lords, and give them leave to speak. Say, gentlemen, what makes you thus exclaim, and wherefore you crave your combat, or with whom? With him, my lord, for he hath done me wrong. And I with him, for he hath done me wrong. What wrong whereof you both complain? First let me know and then I'll answer you. Crossing the sea from England into France, this fellow here with envious carping tongue upbraided me about the rose I wear and in defense of my Lord's worthiness, I crave the benefit of law of arms. And that is my petition, noble Lord, for though he seem with forged quaint consent to set a gloss upon his bold intent, yet know my Lord, 
I was provoked by him, and he first took exception to this badge, pronouncing that the paleness of this flower berayed the faintness of my master's heart. Will not this malice, Somerset, be left? Your private grudge, my lord of York, will out, though ne'er so cunningly you smother it. Good lord, what madness rules in brain-sick men, when for so slight and frivolous a cause such factious emulation shall arise. Good cousins, both of York and Somerset, quiet yourselves, I pray, and be at peace. Let his ascension first be tried by fight, and then your highness shall command a peace. Quarrel toucheth none but us alone. Betwixt ourselves, let us decide it then. There is my pledge. Accept it, Somerset. Nay, let it rest where it began at first. Confirm it so, mine honourable lord. Confirm it so? Confounded be your strife, and perish ye with your audacious prate. Presumptuous vassals, are you not ashamed with this immodest, clamorous outrage to trouble and disturb the king and us? And you, my lords, methinks you do not well to bear with their perverse objections, much less to take occasion from their mouths to raise a mutiny betwixt yourselves. Let me persuade you, take a better course. It grieves his highness. Could my lords be friends? Come hither you that would be combatants. Henceforth I charge you, as you love our favour, quite to forget this quarrel and the cause. And you, my lords, remember where we are, in France, amongst a fickle, wavering nation. If they perceive dissension in our looks, how will their grudging stomachs be provoked to willful disobedience and rebel? Oh, think upon the conquest of my father, my tender years, and let us not forgo that first trifle that was bought with blood. Let me be umpire in this doubtful strife. I see no reason if I wear this rose, that anyone therefore should be suspicious I'm more inclined to Somerset than to York. Both are my kinsmen and I love them both, as well they may upbraid me with my crown because forsooth the King of Scots is crowned. But your discretions better can persuade than I am able to instruct or teach. And therefore, as we hither came in peace, so let us still continue peace and love. Cousins of York, we institute your grace to be our regent in these parts of France, and good my lord of Somerset, unite your troops of horsemen with his bands of foot, and like true subjects, sons of your progenitors, go cheerfully together, and I digest your angry call on your enemies. Ourself, my lord protector, and the rest, after some respite, will return to Calais, from thence to England, where I hope ere long to be presented by your victories, with Charles Allenson and the traitorous rout. <laughs> My lord of York, I promise you, the king prettily, methought, did play the orator. And so he did. But yet I like it not, in that he wears the badge of Somerset. Hush, that was but his fancy. Blame him not. I dare presume, sweet prince, he thought no harm. And if he wist he did, but let it rest. Other affairs must now be managed. Well didst thou, Richard, to suppress thy voice. For had the passions of thy heart burst, burst out, I fear we should have seen deciphered there more rancorous spite, more furious raging broils than yet can be imagined or supposed. But howsoe'er, no simple man that sees this jarring discord of nobility, this shouldering of each other in the court, this factious bandying of their favourite, but that it doth presage some ill event. Tis much when scepters are in children's hands, but more when envy breeds unkind division. There comes the ruin. There begins confusion. Exit. Enter for scene two. Go to the gates of Bordeaux, trumpeter. Summon their general unto the wall. English, John Talbot, captains, calls you forth. Servant in arms to Harry, King of England, and thus he would. Open your city gates. Be humble to us, call my sovereign yours, and do him homage as obedient subjects, and I'll withdraw me and my bloody power. But if you frown upon this proffered peace, 
You tempt the fury of my three attendants, lean famine, quartering steel, and climbing fire. <coughs> Thou ominous and fearful owl of death, our nation's terror and their bloody scourge. The period of thy tyranny approacheth, and us thou canst not enter but by death. Mm. But I protest, we are well fortified and strong enough to issue out and fight. If thou retire, the Dauphin well appointed stands with the snares of war to tangle thee. On either hand thee, there are squadrons pitched to wall thee from the liberty of flight. And no way canst thou turn thee for redress, but death doth front thee with apparent spoil. And pale discretion meets thee in the face. This is the latest glory of thy praise, that I, thy enemy, Judy Withel, for ere the glass that now begins to run, finish the process of his sandy hour. These eyes that see thee now well coloured shall see thee withered, bloody, pale, and dead. Hark! The Dauphin's drum, a warning bell, sings every music to thy timorous soul, and mine shall ring thy dire departure out. He fables not. I hear the enemy. Out, some light horsemen, and peruse their wings. How are we parked? and bounded in a pale. A little herd of England's timorous deer, mazed with a yelping kennel of French curs. If we be English deer, be then in blood, not rascal-like to fall down, but rather moody, mad and desperate stags turn on the bloody hounds with heads of steel and make the coward stand aloof at bay. Sell every man his life as dear as mine, and they shall find dear, dear of us, my friends. God and St. George, Talbot and England's right, prosper our colours in this dangerous fight! Act four, scene three, enter Richard, Duke of York, with trumpets and many soldiers, enter a messenger that meets York. And not the speedy scouts returned again, that dogged the mighty army of the Dauphin. They are returned, my lord, and give it out that he has marched to Bordeaux with his power to fight with Talbot. As he marched along, by your espials were discovered two mightier troops than that the Dauphin led, which joined with him and made their march for Bordeaux. A plague upon that villain Somerset that thus delays my promised supply of horsemen that were levied for this siege. Renowned Talbot doth expect my aid, and I am louted by a traitor villain, and cannot help the noble chevalier. God comfort him in this necessity. If he miscarry, farewell wars in France. Spur to the rescue of the noble Talbot, who is now girdled with a waist of iron and hemmed about with grim destruction. To border warlike Duke, to border York, else farewell Talbot France and England's oh, honour. Oh, that Somerset, who in proud heart doth stop my cornets, were in Talbot's place. Oh, send some suckers to the distressed lord. If he dies, we lose. I break my warlike word. We mourn, France smiles. We lose, they daily get. Oh, long of this veiled traitor Somerset. Then God take mercy on bra brave Talbot's soul and on his son, young John, who to our sins has I met and traveled toward his warlike father. To seven years did not Talbot see his son, and now they meet where both their lives are done. Alas, what joy shall noble Talbot have to bid his young son welcome to his grave? Away, vexation almost stops my breath that sundered friends greet in the hour of death. Exeunt, act four, scene four, enter Somerset with his army and a captain of Talbot. It is too late. I cannot send them now. This expedition was by York and Talbot too rashly plotted. Overdaring Talbot hath sullied all his gloss of former honor by this unheedful, desperate, wild adventure. 
York set him on to fight and die in shame that Talbot dead, great York, might bear the name. Here is Sir William Lucy, who with me set from our o'ermatched forces forth for aid. How now, Sir William, whither were you sent? Whither, my lord? From Borden Law, sold Lord Talbot. And whilst the honourable captain there drops bloody sweat from his war-wearied war limbs and an advantage lingering looks for rescue, you, his false hopes, the trust of England, the trust of England's honour, keep off aloof with worthless emulation. Let not your private discord keep away the levied suckers that should lend him aid. Orléans the bastard, Charles Burgundy, and so on, yet compass him about, and Talbot perisheth by your default. York sent him on. York should have sent him aid. And York is fast upon your grace's flame, swearing that you withheld his levied host collected for his this expedition. York lies. He might have sent and had the horse. I owe him little duty and less love. The fraud of England, not the force of France, hath now entrapped the noble-minded Talbot. Never to England shall he bear his life, but dies betrayed to fortune by your strife. Um, go. I will dispatch the horsemen straight. Within six hours they will be at his side. Too late comes rescue. He's stain or slain, for fly he could not if he would have fled, and fly would Talbot never, though he might. If he be dead, brave Talbot, then adieu. His fame lives in the world, his shame in you. Exeunt. Act four, scene five. Enter Talbot and his son. <laughs> oh, young John Talbot, I, I did send for thee to tutor thee in stratagems of war. But oh, malignant and ill-boding stars, now thou art come to a feast of death. Therefore, dear boy, mount on my swiftest horse, and I'll direct thee how thou shalt escape by sudden flight. Come, tell he not, be gone! Is my name Talbot, and am I your son? <laughs> and shall I fly? Oh, if you love my mother, dishonour not her honourable name to make a bastard and a slave of me. The world will say he is not Talbot's blood that basely fled when noble Talbot stood. Fly to revenge my death if I be slain. He that flies so will ne'er return again. If we both stay, we both are sure to die. Then let me stay, and father, do you fly? Your loss is great, so your regard should be. My worth unknown, no loss is known in me. Upon my death, the French can little boast. In yours they will, in you all hopes are lost. Flights cannot stain the honour you have won, but mine it will that no exploit I've done. You fled for vantage, everyone will swear, but if I bow, they say it was for fear. There is no hope that ever I will stay. If in the first hour I shrink and run away, here on my knee I, I beg mortality, rather than a life preserved with infamy. Shall all thy mother's hopes lie in one tomb? I, rather than I'll shame my mother's womb. Upon my blessing, I command thee go! To fight, I will, but not to fly the foe. Part of thy father may be saved in thee. No part of him but we will be but shame in me. Thou never hast renown, nor canst not lose it. Yes, your renowned name shall fly to abuse it. Thy father's charge shall clear thee from that stain. You cannot witness for me being slain. If death be so apparent, then both fly. And leave my followers here to fight and die. My age was never tainted with such shame. And shall my youth be guilty of such blame? No more can I be severed from your side than can yourself, yourself in, in twain divide. So stay, go, do what you will, the like I do, for live I will not if my father die. Then. Here I take my leave of thee. Fair son, born to eclipse thy life this afternoon. Come, side by side, together live and die. And soul with soul, 
from France to heaven fly. <laughs> Enter Old Talbot, led by the servant. I'm alive! My own is gone! Oh, where is young Talbot? Where is valiant John? Oh, my dear lord, lo, where your son is born! Thou antic death, which laughest us here to scorn. Anon, from thy insulting tyranny, coupled in bonds of perpetuity, two talbots wing it through the leather sky, in thy despite shall scape mortality. O oh, thou, whose wounds become hard favoured death, Speak to thy father, ere thou yield thy breath. Brave death by speaking, whether he will or no. Imagine him a Frenchman and thy foe. Poor boy. He smiles, methinks, as who would say, Hath death been French, then hath death died today. <laughs> <laughs> and lay him in his father's arms. My spirit can no longer bear these harms. Soldiers, adieu. I have what I would have. Now my old arms, I, young John Halbert's grave. Had York and Somerset brought rescue in, we should have found a bloody day of this. How the young whelp of Talbot's raging wood did flesh his puny sword in Frenchman's blood. Once I encountered him, and thus I said, Thou maiden youth, be vanquished by a maid. But with a proud majestical high scorn, he answered thus, Young Talbot was not born to be the pillage of a jiglet wench. So rushing in the bowels of the French, he left me proudly as unworthy fight. Doubtless he would have made a noble knight. See where he lies in Hursed in the arms of the most bloody nurser of his harms. Hew them to pieces, hack their bones asunder, whose life was England's glory, Gallia's wonder. Oh no, forbear. For that which we have fled during the life, let us not wrong it dead. Herald. To dug me to the dolphin's tent to know who hath obtained the glory of the day. On what, on what submissive message art thou sent? Submission to firm, just a mere French word. We English warriors what not what it means. I come to know what prisoners thou hast taken and to survey the bodies of the dead. For prisoners askest thou, hell our prison is, but tell me whom thou seekest. Valiant Lord Talbot, Earl of Shrewsbury. Him that thou seekest lies here at our feet. Is Talbot slain? Frenchman's only scourge? Your king and Sarah and black nemesis? Give me their bodies, that I may bear them hence and give them burial as beseems their worth. For God's sake, let him have them. To keep them here, they would but stink and putrefy the air. Go, take their bodies hence. I'll bear them hence. But from their ashes shall be reared a phoenix that shall make all France a feared. So we be rid of them, do with them what thou wilt. And now, to Paris in this conquering vein, all will be ours now, bloody Talbot slain. Exeunt, Act 5, Scene 1, Senate, Enter the King, Gloucester, and Exeter. Have you perused the letters from the Pope? 
the Emperor and the Earl of Armagnac? I have, my lord, and their intent is this. They humbly sue unto your excellence to have a godly peace concluded of between the realms of England and of France. How doth your grace affect their motion? Well, my good lord, and as the only means to stop a fusion of our Christian blood. I, merry uncle, for I always thought it was both impious and unnatural that such a manity and bloody strife should reign amongst professors of one faith. Beside, my lord, the sooner to effect and sure bind this knot of amity, the Earl of Armagnac, near knit to Charles, proffers his only daughter to your grace in marriage, with a large and sumptuous dowry. Marriage, uncle? Alas, my years are young, and fitter is my study and my books, than want a dalliance with a paramour. Yet, call the ambassador, and as you please, so let them be have their answers every one. I shall be well content with any choice tends to God's glory with my country's wealth. What, is my lord of Winchester installed, and called unto a cardinal's degree? Then I perceive that will be verified. Henry V shall sometime prophesy. If once he come to be a cardinal, he'll make his cap coat equal with the crown. My lord ambassadors, your several suits have been considered and debated on. Your purpose is both good and reasonable and therefore we cer certainly resolve to draw conditions of a friendly peace, which by my Lord of Winchester we mean shall be transported presently to France. And for the proffer of my Lord your master, I have informed his highness so at large as liking of the lady's virtuous gifts, he doth intend she shall be England's queen. In argument and proof of which contract, bear her this jewel, and see them guarded and safely brought Dover, wherein shipped commit them to the fortune of the sea. Stay. <clears throat> Stay, my lord legate. Uh, you shall first receive the sum of money which I promised should be delivered to his holiness for clothing me in these grave ornaments. I will attend upon your lord to leisure. Now. Winchester will not submit, I trow, or be inferior to the proudest peer. Humphrey of Gloucester, thou shalt well perceive the bishop will be overborne by thee. I'll either make thee stoop and bend thy knee, or sack this country with a mutiny. Exeunt. Act 5, Scene 2. Enter Charles, Burgundy, Alençon, the Bastard, Rainier, and Joan Lapercel. These news, my lords, may cheer our drooping spirits. Tis said that the stout Parisians do revolt and turn again under the warlike French. Then march to Paris, royal Charles of France, and keep not back your powers in dalliance. Peace may be amongst them if they turn to us, else ruin combat with their palaces. Success unto our valiant general. What tidings send our scouts, I prithee speak. The English army that divided was into two parties is now conjoined in one and means to give you battle presently. Somewhat too sudden, sirs, the warning is. But we will presently provide for them. I trust the ghost of Talbot is not there. No, he is gone, my lord. You need not fear. Of all base passions, fear is most accursed. Command the conquest, Charles, it shall be thine. Let Henry fret and all the world repine. Then on, my lords, and France be fortunate. <laughs> Act five, scene three.
the regent conquers and the Frenchmen fly. Now help ye charming spells and periaps, and ye choice spirits that admonish me, and give me signs of future accidents. You speedy helpers that are substitutes under the lordly monarch of the north, appear and aid me in this enterprise. This speedy and quick appearance argues proof of your accustomed diligence to me. Now, ye familiar spirits that are culled out of the powerful legions under earth, help me this once that France may get the field. Oh, hold me not with silence over long. Where I was wont to feed you with my blood, I'll lop a member off and give it you, in earnest of a further benefit, so you do condescend to help me now. No hope to have redress? My body shall pay recompense if you will grant my suit. Cannot my body nor blood sacrifice entreat you to your wanted furtherance? Then take my soul, my body, soul, and all before that England give the French the foil. See, they forsake me. Now the time is come that France must veil her lofty plumed crest and let her head fall into England's lap. My ancient incantations are too weak and hell too strong for me to buckle with. Now, France, thy glory droopeth to the dust. <sighs> Damsel of France, I think I have you fast. Unchain your spirits now with spelling charms, and try if they can gain your liberty. A plaguing mischief light on Charles and thee, and may you both be suddenly surprised by bloody hands and sleeping on your beds. Well, burning hag, enchantress, hold thy tongue. I prithee give me leave to curse a while. Curse, miscreant, when thou comest to the stake. <laughs> Be what thou wilt, thou art thy prisoner! <laughs> oh, fairest beauty, do not fear nor fly, for I will touch thee but with reverent hands. And kiss these fingers for eternal peace. Oh, and lay them by thy tender sight. Oh, who art thou say that I may honour thee? Margaret, my name, and daughter of king, the king of Naples, whosoever thou art. An earl am I, and Suffolk am I called. Oh, be not offended, nature's miracle. Well, thou art allotted to be ta'en by me. So doth the swan her dowry signet save, keeping them prisoner underneath their wings. Yet, if this servile usage once offend, go and be free again as Suffolk's friend. Say, Earl of Suffolk, if thy name be so. What ransom must I pay before I pass? For I perceive I am thy prisoner. Why speakst thou not? What ransom must I pay? Oh, she is beautiful, therefore to be wooed. Oh, she is a woman, therefore to be won. Wilt thou accept of ransom? You know. Fond man, remember that thou hast a wife. Then how can Margaret be thy paramour? How are best to leave him, for he will not hear. There all is marred. There lies a cooling cart. He talks at random, sure the man is mad. And yet a dispensation may be had. And yet I would that you would answer me. I'll win this Lady Margaret. For whom? Why, for my king! I Gosh, that's a wooden thing. It talks of wood. It is some carpenter. Yet, so my fancy may be satisfied and peace established between these realms. But there remains a scruple in that too. For though her father be king of Naples, Duke of Anjou and Maine, yet he is poor and our nobility will scorn the match. Hey, ye, Captain, are you not at leisure? It shall be so. I disdain thee in there so much. Henry is youthful and will quickly yield. Madam, 
I have a secret to reveal. What? Though so I be enthralled. He seems a knight and will not in any way dishonor me. Lady, vouchsafe to listen to what I say. Perhaps I shall be rescued by the French, and then I need not crave his mercy. Sweet madam, give me a hearing and a cause. Gosh, women have been captiv captivated now. Lady, wherefore talk you so? I cry you mercy, tis but quid for quo. Oh, say, gentle princess, would you not suppose your bondage happy to be made a queen? To be a queen in bondage is more vile than a slave in base civility, for princes should be free. And so shall you be, if happy England's royal king be free. Why? What concerns this freedom unto me? I will undertake to make thee Henry's queen, to put a golden scepter in thy hand and set a precious crown upon thy head, if thou will condescend to be my... What? His love. Mm -hmm. I am unworthy to be Henry's wife. No, gentle madam, I unworthy am to woo so fair a dame to be his wife and have no portion in the choice myself. Well, how say you, madam? Are ye so content? And if my father please, I am content. Then call our captains and our colours forth. And madam, at your father's walls, no crave a parley to confer with him. Sound a parley. See Renier. See thy daughter prisoner. To whom? To me. Suffolk, what remedy? Hmm? I am a soldier and unapt to weep or to exclaim on fortune's fickleness. Yet there is remedy enough, my lord. Consent and for thy honour give consent. Thy daughter shall be wedded to my king. Speaks Suffolk as he thinks? Well, fair Margaret knows that Suffolk nor doth not flatter face nor fame. Upon thy princely warrant I descend to give the answer of thy just demand. And here I will await thy coming. Welcome, brave Earl, into our territories. Command in Anjou what your honour pleases. What answer makes your grace unto my suit? My daughter shall be Henry's, if he pleases. That is her ransom, and I deliver her. And those two countries I will undertake, your grace shall well and quietly enjoy. And I, again, in Henry's royal name as deputy unto that gracious king, give thee her hand, the sign of plighted faith. Renier of France, I give thee kingly thanks, because this is in traffic of a king. And yet, methinks I could be so well content to be my own attorney in this case. I'll over to England then with this news and make this marriage to be solemnized. I do embrace thee as I would embrace the Christian prince. King Henry, were he here? Oh well, my lord. Good wishes, praise and prayers shall Suffolk ever have of Margaret. Farewell, sweet madam. Oh, but hark you, Margaret. No princely commendations to my king. Such commendations as becomes a maid, a virgin, and his servant say to him. Words sweetly placed and modestly directed. But, madam, I must trouble you again. No loving token to his majesty. Yes, my good lord. A pure and spotted heart, never yet tainted with love, I send the king. And this with all. That for thyself. <laughs> I will not so presume to send such peevish tokens to a king. Oh, where thou for myself? But Suffolk stay, thou mayst not wonder in that labyrinth. Solicit Henry with her wondrous praise. Bethink thee on her virtues that surmount, and natural graces that extinguish art. Repeat. Their semblance often on the seas. Thou well then come with thine then comes to kneel at Henry's feet. Thou mayst bereave him of his wits with wonder. Exit 
Act five, scene four. Enter Richard, Duke of York, Warwick, a shepherd, and Joan Lapoussel, guarded. Bring forth that sorceress condemned to burn. Ah, uh, Joan, this kills thy father's heart outright. Ah, uh, Joan, sweet daughter Joan, I will die with thee. Decrepit miser, base and noble wretch, I am descendant of a gentler blood. Thou art no father nor no friend of mine. Out, out. My lords, and please you, tis not so. I did beget her, all the parish knows. Her mother liveth yet can testify she was the first fruit of my bachelorship. Graceless, wilt thou deny thy parentage? This argues what her kind of life hath been, wicked and vile, and so her death concludes. By Joan, that thou wilt be so obstacle, God knows thou art the collop of my flesh. Hasn't of vaunt, you have suborned this man a purpose to obscure my noble birth. Tis true. I gave a noble to the priest the morn that I was wedded to her mother. Kneel down and take my blessing, good girl. Dost thou deny thy father cursed trap? Oh, burn her. Burn her. Hanging is too good. Take her away, for she hath lived too long to fill the world with vicious qualities. First, let me tell you whom you have condemned. Not me begotten of a shepherd swain, but issued from the progeny of kings. Virtuous and holy chosen from above by inspiration of celestial grace to work exceeding miracles on earth. I never had to do with wicked spirits, but you, that are polluted with your lust, stained with the guiltless blood of innocence, corrupt and tainted with a thousand vices, because you want the grace that others have. You judge it straight, a thing impossible to compass wonders by the help of devils. No, misconceive it. Joan of Arc hath been a virgin from her tender infancy, chaste and immaculate in very thought, whose maiden blood thus rigorously effused will cry for vengeance at the gates of heaven. Aye, aye, away with her to execution. Place barrels of pitch upon the fatal stake that so her torture may be shortened. Then leave me hence, with whom I leave my curse. May never glorious sun reflect his beams upon the country where you make abode. Darkness and the gloomy shade of death environ you till mischief and despair drive you to break your necks or hang yourself. Break thou in pieces and consume to ashes, thou foul accursed minister of hell. Lord Regent, I do greet your excellence with letters of commission from the king. For know, my lords, the states of Christendom, moved with remorse of these outrageous broils, have earnestly implored a general peace betwixt our nation and the aspiring French. Ah, and here at hand, the Dauphin and his train approacheth to confer about some matter. Is all our travail turned to this effect? Shall we at last conclude effeminate peace? Have we not lost most part of all the towns? By treason, falsehood, and by treachery, our great progenitors had conquered? Oh, Warwick, Warwick, I foresee with grief the utter loss of all the realm of France. Be patient, York. If we conclude a peace, it shall be with such strict and severe covenants as little shall the Frenchmen gain thereby. Since, Lords of England, it is thus agreed that peaceful truce shall be proclaimed in France, we come to be informed by ourselves what the conditions of that league must be. Speak, Winchester, for boiling choler chokes the hollow passage of my poison voice. Charles and the rest, it is enacted thus, that in regard King Henry gives consent of mere compassion and of lenity to ease your country of distressful war and suffer you to breathe in fruitful peace. You shall become true liegeman to his crown, and Charles, upon condition thou wilt swear to pay him tribute and submit thyself, thou shalt be placed as viceroy under him, and still enjoy thy regal dignity. This proffer is absurd and reasonless. Tis known already that I am possessed with more than half the Gallian territories, and therein reverenced for their lawful king. No, Lord Ambassador. I'll rather keep that which I have 
coveting for more than be cast from possibility of all. Insulting Charles. Hostile by secret means used intercession to obtain a league. And now the matter grows to compromise, standest thou aloof upon comparison? Either accept the title thou usurpst of benefit proceeding from our king and not of any challenge of desert, or we will plague thee with incessant wars. My lord, you do not well in obstinacy to cavil in the course of this contract. If once it be neglected, ten to one, we shall not find like opportunity. Hmm? And therefore, take part of a truce, although you break it when your pleasure serves. How sayest thou, Charles? Shall our condition stand? It shall. Only reserved you claim no interest in any of our towns of garrison. And swear allegiance to his majesty, as thou art knight, never to disobey nor be rebellious to the crown of England, thou nor thy nobles to the crown of England. So, now dismiss your army when ye please. Hang up your ensigns, <gasps> let your drums be still. For here we entertain a solemn peace. Exeunt. Act 5, Scene 5. Enter Suffolk in conference with the King, Gloucester, and Exeter. Your wondrous rare descriptions, noble oral of beauteous Margaret, hath astonished me. Oh, tush, my good lord. This superficial tale is but a preface of her worthy praise, and which is more, she is not so divine, so full, replete with choice of all delights, but with his humble loneliness of mind. She is content to be at your command. Command, I mean, of virtuous chase intents to love and honour Henry as her lord. And otherwise will Henry ne'er presume. Therefore, my lord, protector, give consent that Margaret may be England's royal queen. So should I give consent to flatter sin. You know, my lord, your highness is betrothed unto another lady of esteem. How shall we then dispense with that contract and not to face your honour with reproach? As doth a ruler with unlawful oaths, or one that at a triumph, having vowed to try his strength, forsaketh yet the less by reason of his adversary's odds. A poor earl's daughter is unequal odds, and therefore may be broke without offence. Why? What, I pray, is Margaret more than that? Her father is no better than an earl, although in glorious titles he excel. Well, yes, my lord, her father is a king, the king of Naples and Jerusalem, and of such great authority in France, and his alliance will confirm our peace and keep the Frenchmen in allegiance. And so the Earl of Armagnac may do, because he is near kinsman unto Charles. Besides, his wealth doth warrant a liberal dower, where rainy air sooner will receive than give. A dower, my lords. Disgrace not so your king, that he should be so abject, base, and poor to choose for wealth and not for perfect love. Henry is able to enrich his queen and not seek a queen to make him rich. Marriage is a matter of more worth than to be dealt in any attorneyship. Not whom we will, but whom his grace affects must be companion of his nuptial bed. Whom should we match with Henry being a king, but Margaret that his daughter to a king? Her peerless feature joined with her birth approves her fit for none but for a king. Her valiant courage and undaunted spirit more than in women commonly is seen will answer our hope and issue of a king. For Henry's son unto a conqueror is likely to beget more conquerors if with a lady of so high resolve as a spare of Margaret, he be linked in love. Then yield, my lords, and here conclude with me that Margaret shall be queen and none but she. Whether it be through force of your report, my noble lord of Suffolk, or for that my tender youth was never yet attained with any passion of inflaming love, I cannot tell. But this I am assured, I feel such sharp dissension in thy breast, such fierce alarms both of hope and fear, as I am sick with the working of my thoughts. Take therefore sh shipping, post my lord to France, agree to any covenants and procure that Lady Margaret do vouchsafe to come to cross the seas to England and be crowned King Henry's faithful and anointed queen, 
Be gone, I say, for till you do return. I rest perplexed with a thousand cares, and you, good uncle, banish all offense if you do censor me by what you were, not what you are. I know will excuse a sudden execution of my will. And so conduct me where from company I may resolve and ruminate my grief. My grief, I fear me, both at first and last. <laughs> Thus Suffolk have prevailed, and thus he goes, as did the youthful Paris once to Greece, with hope to find the like of ends and love, but prosper better than the Trojan did. Margaret shall now be queen and rule the king, but I will rule her, the king and realm. And here concludes the first part of Henry the Sixth. Cast, if we can have you all back on stage. Congratulations, give yourself a big round of applause. Fantastic work, everyone. Thank you so, so much for that. Really stunning, really stunning stuff. We're on about a 10 second delay, so the audience is going to find out very soon that we finished, and I'm sure they'll be clapping along, saying there was lot, lots of... Uh, uh, we had a lot of clapping emojis mixed with a lot of hand-washing emojis before, which feels appropriate to the times. Uh, so that was all wonderful. I think we have, in the meantime, a couple of remaining questions uh, from our interval that it might be nice to cast an eye over. Sarah, do you have those? I do, actually. There, so there was a couple of comments um, at the end there, which related to a question that was asked earlier on, was about how much text was cut Yes. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we got an edit of the text done uh, by Dan Bolio of Seven Stages of Shakespeare. Our um, objective was to keep it to two and a half hours, which, given that this play is almost cut in its entirety most of the time, uh, felt like a, a generous amount but wouldn't outstay our audience's welcome. So that was the uh, reason behind the cut. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I thought Dan did a great job with it. Um, and yeah, let us know uh, what bits that were missing that you wished were there. That might be an interesting topic of conversation. Do we have uh, any other ones, Sarah? Yes. Um, so this is one for Kristen, actually, that came up earlier. Um, what prep did you do for Talbot? Um, and they remarked that you had great specificity um, and clarity in, in your words. Uh, firstly, whoever you are, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what, what, what prep did I do? I mean, I'm, I'm a, there are so many ways of, um, of approaching Shakespeare. For me, it's all about the text, you know, and, and, and Rob, um, very kindly sends us so much information, you know, backstory. And, and he's, he's, he's already a sort of a minefield of things when I go, you know, what's this moment about? Or, Oh, it seems like Talbot's contradicted himself there. Rob is, is a brilliant director and, and comes on board with any questions that I have. So for me, it's just read the text, read the text, read the text, read the text. Um, and everything you need is there. The, the historical John Talbot is a different guy to the one that's in the play, you know. And, and for me, it was just, I think, like I said earlier, I'm just, it, it sounds like a crap answer, but it's true. You know, you just, say the words and they'll give you what you need and take you where you need to go. And you don't, um, one of my favorite teachers when I was training said, um, the lines where you struggle are the lines where you find the key to the character. So for someone who is so much bluster and everything, for me, unlocking John Talbot was when we rehearsed that scene with his son. Um, because John Talbot is not a vulnerable man, doesn't do vulnerability. So rehearsing that scene was like, oh, here's, here's the human being you know, and um, basically it's just, just read the play, just just know the play back to front. That's your prep. <laughs> wonderful, <laughs> wonderful. Right. <laughs> uh, just got a, a comment from our audience. They said they really missed the bit where uh, Joan claimed that she was with child. Uh, which is one of the cuts that was made. Uh, I imagine that Dan was probably uh, a little bit similar to you, Jessica, in that he seems to have been a fan of Joan of Arc. He's cut some of her more dubious moral uh, actions that Shakespeare wrote into this play. Yeah, I, d I didn't miss it. <laughs> <laughs> Happy you didn't have to play that. Yeah, yeah. Send her out on top, looking strong. Brilliant, brilliant. Sarah, do you have Ooh. any others? 
Yes. Oh, I have one question, which, um, Ema, if you're there, you are. Yes, I can see you. Um, you might be able to help us with this one. There was a question around full staff and false staff. And because I think it's fast off, fa isn't fast, it? The, yeah, the off. alternative. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Do you, That's, a can... <laughs> That's a good question. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be honest here. Um, um, I, I don't really focus on early modern history, theater history per se. So I feel like somebody like Martin Wiggins, or maybe uh, I think I think it's, I saw Joe Stevenson who's on the on the live chat as well. He'd probably have something to say about that too. Um, I mean, it's an interesting theory, but I feel like I'm. Uh, I feel like I, I I wouldn't really have an answer to that. But it's an interesting theory, though. Or, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. It was interesting because we had this debate when we were doing the edit around uh, mm. full staff versus fast off. Uh, and yes. it was very much a matter of, um, was this kind of a prototype for the character that then emerges in Henry IV? Uh, and it kind of made sense that it would be, um, yeah. because of course they were written in this sequence. So the fact that there's now a continuity error because Will mm. Kemp went off to do his nine days wonder uh, and Shakespeare killed <laughs> yeah. him off off stage, kind of creates this kind of yeah. uh, hole in the bridge almost between mm. the, the series of plays. But I just thought it was a really interesting, uh, just a bit of trivia really, a tidbit. Um, yeah. I, I was originally going to go with fast off because of the continuity mm. error kind of thing. Uh, but then mm. it, uh, uh, a friend, uh, Jeremy Mortimer, who's been a wonderful advisor on some of the historical detail of this, said, no, keep it as mm. full staff because Shakespeare mm. did that continuity error, not us. So keep it in. That's true. And also as well, you know, you do have like, um, you know, when, uh, when you get to the Henry IV plays and the differences, you know, um, well, it's just generally across the histories, you know, the difference between Old Castle and Falstaff and, you know, all of that as well. So, yeah, continuity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah. How hmm. are we doing, Sarah? Have we got any more? Oh, yes. Um, so I have, um, oh, actually, I've got one for Harley. Uh, so someone asked, um, how, are you playing a lot of characters in this one? <laughs> Um, obviously, there was a lot of multi-rolling, but I think you had the most uh, changes. So how do you differentiate all of your characters? Um, just costumes. Just, uh, it was really help. At first I thought, wait, what? The blue people, the red people, the white roses, the red roses. Who's? It took me forever to figure out. And then this morning I went, oh my God, and there's another one I didn't think about. So, but one. <laughs> I figured out the costumes and I had this cheat sheet for myself, which I have to show because, so that took me forever. So that's all my notes to myself. And once I figured out the red sweater, the green shirt and the blue sweater, and then the, the hats, then that's the only way I kept them straight. And even then I was in the middle of a scene and noticed that I was nodding and smiling at somebody, but they were the wrong color. And then I went, oh, whoa. <laughs> on every different um, faction in the play. I'm sure that has happened in every single production of this show that's ever happened. It is wildly confusing. And we've all had great fun uh, with just three days to try and kind of figure out our way through that maze. Uh, I think Meg, if you're there, I feel like you might have popped off at this point. I can't quite see you there, but Meg, you had a lot of uh, interesting character changes as well, didn't you? Yeah, that one where, so there's like a, a feature on, on Zoom where you can make your screen, um, you can make it into a green screen. So I, when I had the army there, I sort of realized, I was like, oh my God, I have to be there for the queue, but I also have to get changed. And then you could see like a white sleeve coming in, sort of going out. So that was funny, but amazing. Yeah, yeah. it was fun. <laughs> Amazing. Got lots of questions pouring in now. Uh, our wonderful uh, elves, Ed, uh, on the YouTube is kind of conveying these to us as we speak. Um, one question, how did you decide casting? Wow. So that was a process. Uh, there are something like 60 odd characters in this play. Um, so it was no small feat to just even create the ensemble tracks. And that's all thanks to our incredible producer, Sarah, who, uh, when I was having uh, a borderline nervous breakdown about it, uh, managed to actually wrangle that beast uh, and put it into some kind of sensible order through the wonder of Excel, which is still kind of dark magic to me. Uh, yeah, no, thank you so much, Sarah, for that. Uh, and then after that, just the actors that submit themselves, you know, we take a look, we uh, see who we like, 
Um, and it's not that we don't like anyone that we don't cast. I want to make that point very clear. There is an overabundance of people that want to be involved and we can only cast so many people each week. Uh, but we just like to give as many people as we can chances. Uh, and, you know, it's paid off so far. We've had incredible casts week after week. So thank you everyone for continuing to want to get involved. And if you want to get involved, you can go to robmiles.co.uk forward slash the show must go online and hit take part uh, to fill out your expression of interest. And then we'll be in touch with you about the next casting, which will go out tomorrow. Can, uh, can I can I get briefly political on that note? Yeah. Um, just I, just to hijack. Um, uh, given in, in in the era of um, the attempt at fifty fifty casting and whatnot, it is so wonderful to have so many women um, being cast by the wonderful Rob and in roles that you would never play in many many mediums, like even theatre, where there's this push for diverse casting. Um, so it is a joy to get to do the history plays where women are kind of sidelined with the exception of Joan, you know, so, <laughs> so yeah, if, if you are an actor out there and, and it's don't, you know, you might get to play incredible things. Please, please do apply. This has been the best fun. Thank you, Rob. You're brilliant. Thank you, mate. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all. Uh, we actually, have here. Sorry, oh, yeah, go on, I was going to say, actually, there was a question earlier um, on that point. So um, Kristen, or if anyone else wants to jump in as well, um, but um, on that basis, do you think that that casting balance is, and the cross gender casting is something that more companies should do? Absolutely. I don't think there's any reason not to, um, unless, I mean, there are some roles that inherently need to be played by certain actors. You know, if it's an actor uh, who is differently abled um, and, and, you know, very specific requirements that um, only a certain actor could bring, but this was so great, like to play against Kristen, uh, you know, in this, these great fights and, um, and we have a, you know, Dauphin who was female and it was, it was just really great. And then going through, I was like, oh, well, this doesn't really change the story at all. It's just still great actors playing these characters. Um, so it was really great fun to play with everybody in this group. And it's my, it's uh, oh, sorry, go on, Kristen. No, I was going to say, it, it's so lovely as well that you don't think about playing a man, you just think about playing the character. Because, uh, you know, again, I'm, I'm a hippie, you know, I, I, I sort of, you know, I, I think we're, we're just playing human beings and at no point during rehearsals did Rob say, can you do that in a, in a more masculine way? Butch. Or, you know, <laughs> yeah. you know it's, just, it's just, what does this human being feel? And, um, you know, and I know that probably I'm never going to forget to play this role again. So the liberation of that actually I think makes you braver, you know, and stops you, you know, maybe sort of holding back in the way that you normally would as a performer. Yeah, moment. absolutely. I mean, I, I do want to give a shout out to Scott Ellis, our erstwhile swing, who has been sitting on tenterhooks all afternoon, uh, ready to uh, step in at a moment's notice. Thank you so much, Scott. But he's also the artistic director of Mealy Theatre, who've done gender blind casting for years. Uh, and it's definitely where uh, I was, uh, not, not that I was ever against it, but certainly that I saw the proof in the pudding, as it were. Um, and we always used to say that uh, in Shakespeare's time, uh, actors were all men and actors played all the parts. And now actors are men and women, so men and women can play all the parts. I don't think there should be any barrier, uh, because there wouldn't have been in Shakespeare's day to a man playing a woman. Therefore, nowadays, there shouldn't be any barrier to a woman playing playing a man. Um, I'd love to throw it over uh, to Elizabeth, please, if that's all right, because it took a, a while longer than I anticipated, but some people in the chat have noticed the Star Trek connection <laughs> and got very excited about it. But as you have played a Starfleet captain before, I believe that's correct, is it? Lieutenant Commander. Lieutenant Commander. I apologise. I apologise for putting you as lowly as a captain. Lieutenant Commander. Wonderful. Um, so what was it like for you playing Gloucester? What was that experience like? You know, it's it's a funny thing. The part I played on Star Trek, first of all, I was 28 when I played that part. People, I don't think, it's amazing to me that people still remember because it was 30 years ago. And uh, when I first did that part, Everybody, this is the way the world has changed since then in 30 years. I would go to conventions and people would say, oh, I hated you, you were such a bitch. And now when I meet people, they say, you are absolutely right. Didn't matter how your tone or your stridency, you were absolutely right in trying to save the ship. So in 30 years time, that is just an indication of how, how things have changed. And I think now, 
um, just get the job done. Who is best for the job is is what's most important now, which is a glimmer of hope, I think. So it, it, again, what, what Kristen was saying is that, you know, just get the job done. I am Lord Protector and this is a young boy and I am going to do the job. And I know that this saucy priest is has got ulterior motives. And uh, so whatever it takes, not caring what people think is something that connected me back to um, Shelby. Does that make sense? Yes, it absolutely does. Yeah, yeah, 100%. 100%. I think, I think it's fascinating, that idea that society, I guess, has become more open-minded and they're re-looking re at old material in different ways. I think that's absolutely fascinating that such a thing could be true of Star Trek, as indeed it is of Shakespeare. I think that's a, a fascinating link between those two, you know, the kind of high-minded yeah. sci-fi... Uh, and then one of, these, one of these days our country will catch up to the notion that a woman could be leader Imagine yeah <laughs> oh you heard it here first everyone <laughs> absolutely let's hope so let's hope so and uh, I, just... I always didn't do that great a job just saying <laughs> <laughs> that's true Wonderful, wonderful. Sarah, do you have any more questions? Uh, yes, there was one earlier, which is a nice broad one, which I think um, people can chip into, but, um, and actually, uh, Ema as well, it'd be great to hear your thoughts, but um, someone asked, what is the main theme of Henry VI? That's a great question. Mm. I would say it's probably power, because I... I kind of think that every single scene has so many power struggles and obviously there's the wider ones over France and England and all the kind of towns and but then there's also within England there's all these factions and it's all mm -hmm. about who has power over each other and there's in every scene there's a there's a power struggle and mm. um, it's kind of I guess it's interesting going back to the um, the gender thing because it's I think it's different when you see it when it, all of the kind of lords are played as men and it's very much like um, I guess like Rob was saying in rehearsals like the House of Commons or the House of Lords where it is mostly a lot of men shouting at each other um, but it you know it's still the same effect um, the way that we we did it and it's this kind of everyone trying to get the last word in and even the little petty things and even arguing about roses, but it's actually about so much more. Um, that was quite a waffly answer. No, it was great. Oh, it I love it. Charlotte, go for it. Yes, so it's the first time I've watched it through. And with that question, I felt it most strongly in the scene between Talbot and his son and uh, uh, the subject of loyalty and as a real um, sort of, you know, uh, rise to the cause of loyalty for England that this history play would be that kind of, um, sort of serve that uh, message. That's what I saw. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's also, there's also lineage, I think is a major mm, yeah. part of it. Yeah, yeah. I, was, I was gonna, Go on, Kristen, go on, why not? <laughs> um, well, it's, it's because when we were rehearsing it, because that's what, it's what Rob talked about with me, is, I, spoiler, for those of you who are going to tune into part two and part three, I think lineage is the overarching thing of the whole Henry VI thing, because it's about who your father was, who your great, great, great grandfather was, and this, this scene, you know, um, earlier with Richard Plant Plantagenet, you know, and, and Richard Plantagenet is going to go, you know, his, his son is, is the Richard the Third, you know, and and there's this there's this feeling of every generation that doesn't make it, you pass the baton on, and you mm -hmm. pass on you pass on that rage and that struggle until it becomes almost as messy for everyone on stage. You almost don't know, you know, what you're fighting for anymore, other than your family, your house, you know, the the white roses and the red roses, and your humanity gets lost, and your your grip on your own humanity, and then it all filters down to Richard the Third, where he's alone. And yeah. they, were upset, they were obsessed by this in the 1590s because um, Elizabeth had no child. So ah. they, they didn't realise, they, you know, they were worried who would succeed. So yeah. all these plays are examinations of who should succeed in that situation. Yeah. So it was yeah. a highly politicised thing to be writing about. Absolutely. And you oh. renegade. <laughs> oh. What's that? Sorry, one more um, time? 
Ema, you've been you've been nodding. <laughs> oh yeah, sorry. No, um, I was going to let Kristen talk. Sorry. <laughs> so, so, were you going to say something? Oh, sorry. Yeah, no. I think when you when you see these plays, you know, not just not, not just the Henry the Sixth plays and Richard the Third, but when you incorporate the entire cycle of history plays from Richard the Second onwards towards Richard the Third, kind of nice the uh, mirroring, I suppose. But it is that ongoing narrative of kingship, of, of, of um, succession and power, and how family gets tied into that, and, and seeing that develop and that switching of power, that exchange, it really comes out so well when you see all these plays, when you read all these plays in sequence, for sure. Yeah, I'm really excited to do it. It's 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 mm -hmm. interesting as well for me the the kind of relationship and you know it is it is kind of uh, male centered if you like, but the relationship between fathers and sons seems to be so very important because even Henry the Sixth's kind of mismanagement of, of the situation as as he grows up is because his father died very young and so he didn't have his father there to bring him up quote unquote properly uh, and there's so much stuff there about kind of absent fathers or bad fathers uh, leading to sort of uh, rotten apples if you like um, and I think there's a really interesting theme that kind of gets picked up several times across the plays um, all, all around parentage uh, and and the the duty of parents to their children in order to kind of I guess prepare them for success yeah um, wonderful oh someone said how was the fiends scene created technically <laughs> Meg, do you want to take that one? I can take that one. Um, it's it's a feature on Zoom, which uh, <laughs> everyone should know about, really, for work meetings and everything else. Um, is uh, you can make your back you can make your background. Oh, there we go. Will's Will's a fiend. Um, <laughs> you can make your background a video, so you can just put a video. And then if you select, I'm using a green screen. It thinks that anything that's not really, really bright, I guess, or really different to your background color is um, a green screen. So then it makes the video go everywhere and you get this kind of haunting effect as Will is demonstrating. <laughs> Wonderful. And uh, we've got another one here and this is for, uh, well, I know the answer, but let's let him give it himself. Who composed the music? I don't know. Is he there? Richard? Richard? <laughs> da, 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 da. Where is he? Oh! <laughs> I, was I can see him. I can see him. He's still on the call. I'm hoping he'll come and join us and talk about <laughs> it. It might, be, it might be busy packing away all these various drums and trumpets and things of that nature. <laughs> But yes, the answer is Richard Hand, who is uh, an incredible Foley artist and has done several kind of live radio plays and things of that nature. Uh, we're very fortunate. Somebody reached out to us on Twitter um, and said, you know, uh, love what you're doing and, and is there anything we can do to help? And I think they were a radio producer. Uh, and so we just said, you know, do you happen to know any kind of Foley artists? Because for these kind of plays with so much action and mass battles and things that in this medium we could never kind of countenance otherwise, uh, it really felt like it was going to be an essential feature. Uh, and I'm happy to say that uh, obviously Richard got involved uh, and did an absolutely tremendous job. And again, in very, very little time, uh, he was queuing everything live and doing all that kind of stuff, as well as actually producing all the music as well. Um, and so, yeah, he's been an absolute gem uh, and we've loved it. Uh, loved having him on board. So thank you, mate. Thank you. <laughs> there he is. is there it, he is, is Richard. Is Did you just wait to come on until I'd complimented you enough? Was that the idea? <laughs> <laughs> so do you want to tell people how you kind of compose the music or is it trade secrets? No, yeah, it was just stub sourcing various sounds, really, soundscapes. I'm doing, obviously, with the current situation, I, I can't get to all my Foley equipment or anything, which is a shame. I would like to have done more, more of that, but I um, did my best. Um, but sourcing different sounds and editing stuff together, yeah, so that's, that's what I did, really. Fabulous, fabulous. Well, thank you for doing it, mate, because it really, really did add so much. And we've got comments here from the audience. The SFX added a lot. Great job. Really added to the battle scenes. Music and sound effects were so cool. Didn't expect those. So there we go. We've managed to surprise our audience. 
as as we go through all 37 plays, it's going to be interesting to see what <laughs> other tricks we can try and pull out of the bag. Um, uh, someone's also said, uh, I really liked the uh, fake blood. Uh, so, Janet, would you like to talk us through your incredibly dramatic uh, cannon explosion? <laughs> Where's she gone? Oh, you got it. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on. Oh, there we go. Hello. Oh, yeah. Sorry, click the wrong button. Click the wrong <laughs> button. Um, uh, yeah, rum rummaging through my my cupboards, um, the 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 cannon debris uh, was well toasted porridge, uh, which went nicely brown and creates an enormous mess. <laughs> I, did, I, I had a pause in between Salisbury dying and the next one, and I actually had to get the broom out because it was just everywhere. Um, and the blood is take one pot strawberry jam, heavy dash of tomato ketchup, and for eyes, one Victoria plum, mix well, and just go. <laughs> oh, and a lot of, lot of black eye makeup for the, for the, um, for the eyes. It was good. Amazing. It, but, but I mean, it was like, I had I had today. I wasn't going to risk trashing my house, my living room twice. So it was like, you know, let's see if it works. Yes, that's it. Yeah, it'll be all right on the night. Uh, we've also got a shout out here saying uh, love to Yarrett on on Reek for the fight as well. So congratulations, you guys. Thank you so much for that. It's so interesting to see Shakespeare's kind of use of uh, kind of mass battle and clamor versus those one on one duels. Uh, and it's really great to have people in actually kind of go being able to do that Two people self-isolating with the right set of skills together uh, to enable us to have that. So it's really wonderful, really wonderful. All right, marvellous. So I think we are going to leave it there, ladies and gentlemen. And so, so oh, oh, go on, go on. No, 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 no. You do self-isolate with props as well. You know what I mean? It's, uh, it's <laughs> Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Right props as well. Right, uh, right. Yes, and thank you so much for um, for Talbot's signature battle axe as well. That is an impressive prop. Wonderful stuff, wonderful stuff. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. We will be back next week with, of all things, Henry the Sixth, Part Two. So, please uh, like and subscribe and hit the bell notification on the link in order to get. Uh, a lovely notification, so I'd invite our actors at this time to all take your microphones off mute and give yourselves a final rousing round of applause because you absolutely hey! deserve it. Next <laughs> week, everybody, thank you so much. And remember, like, subscribe, follow us, all that kind of stuff. Hashtag show must go online. Thank you. Thank you.